Well, hello, hello, belief. Hello, hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us. I hope you brought your comfort blankets. Safety blanket. Yeah. It's going to be a spooky episode today, guys. It's going to be creepy. Get back to the roots. Yeah, because the last one we had was fun. Well, I get the election was kind of creepy. The sky whales and the sky jellies. Not really, though. I mean, it was interesting. You got creeped out a little bit in there when you're like, I'm never going outside again. It was a joke. It was kind of creepy for me. I felt like I did catch myself outside a couple times after that episode. It's just like, being like the birds, like Alfred Hitchcock type creepy, though. It's not like haunt your dreams yeah, it's, creepy. It's more like you're in the woods alone. What's out here? You know, there might be something that's yeah. going to prey upon me, but not like a, not a spiritual It's more disturbance. like if there was an alligator behind you. Right. Like that kind of creepy. But yeah, that's not, cre- not boogeyman creepy. And that's where we're going today, right, guys? Yeah, yeah we're going into the closet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we're going into the closet. <laughs> uh, Entendre and unattended. Yeah, we thought we would do an episode on the classic, the classic concept of the other, the boogeyman, the dark figure in the places unseen and hidden. Yeah, you know, we, we started talking about, like, what is, to get back to a spookier episode, what is some of the more terrifying concepts generally for everyone? And it was the idea of something in the closet, some creature, some something entity. in the closet. We started, well, we've talked about for a while, we've been talking, discussing the idea of thresholds and doorways. And what is it about certain aspects of our physical reality that the spirit world might also be held account to, the physical reality that we live in? Yeah, especially bedrooms, because, you know, you're most vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Which is extra scary. Sleeping. That's where almost all, well, I've only had a couple really paranormal experiences. Actually, all of them. The shadow person, terrifying encounter was in the bed. The poltergeist cup flying at my kind face of was in the bedroom. Different bedroom, but a bedroom nonetheless. And, Did you uh, say sleep paralysis? Yeah, the out-of-body experience I had was also in, the, in my bedroom. Yeah, you know, and that, that idea too, the shadow person, the hat man, these are a form of boogeyman, right? Right, it's just a modern sort of look at it. Well, not really modern. I mean, as far as the shadow person, that's gone back, cultural references for a long time. Right, I guess I was referring more to the hat man, sort of, uh, you know, with the advent of the internet, you have these ideas spreading and there's sort of a lore that gets developed online. And the invention of hats. It's just, and the invention of hats, fedoras. The shadow hipster, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> that's a, just a repackaging of ancient ideas and yeah. concepts. So we're definitely going to touch on some of these classic boogeymen creatures and archetypes around the world and in different cultures throughout time. Yeah. That's the beginning of the episode. I like this idea, the the concept of the boogeyman. Everyone's been a kid and been afraid of, you know, what's in the closet, what's under the bed. That's always been a thing for me, like not wanting to get up in the middle of the night because when you put your foot down, what's going to grab it, you know? Were you one of those people that would... If something happened, you'd just cover yourself? No, that seems ridiculous. <laughs> I never understood that. No, we, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to cover yourself and then it's going to go away? Oh, it seems to work for some people, but it might just be more of the, uh, you know. It seems to work for some <laughs> What? How many people have you met? For I've, I've read a lot of stories about people who they have this terror, they can't do anything. They, you know, you basically shut yourself off from the experience and you. That's true. The spirits are very time. needy. And if you don't give it your attention, maybe they're just like, oh, that's. Damn it, he did the cover damn thing. It. <laughs> There's an argument for that. Yeah. Quit putting a blanket over your head. <laughs> I'm trying to perform. I'm trying to Susie scare you. Susie Lee, <laughs> take that blanket off your... <laughs> That's expired. But anyway, yeah. But yeah, it's a fascinating idea. And, and that idea of thresholds, it, it kind of got our brains churning a little bit. And we started thinking about the idea of spirit architecture. Like the idea of building homes, building cities, just building in general, keeping the idea of spirits in mind. And how do you do that to avoid interaction with negative entities? Yeah, the, actually the title of the episode... Uh, I had tentatively was entities in the closet, spirit architecture, or ethereal barriers barricading the boogeyman and confounding spirits through design. That is a surely a long title. What? Yeah, it's very <laughs> keyword friendly. It's like a Sufjan Stevens track name. <laughs> yeah, it's a long title. You have to like sit down and process that. Right. But the idea, I like the idea of uh, ethereal barriers, that's hard to say, and barricading the boogeyman. Like the idea that you can do things to protect yourself from these. Is it sort of like the Ghostbusters trap? Oh my God. That was such a good episode, that cartoon. Do you remember that episode? I just meant in general that little thing that they would oh. toss out. And well, that's suck more them of in. a response. That's a capture. Yeah, I'm talking about like a prevention. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. It's like a condom as opposed to a diaphragm. Wow. Good analogy. Actually, that makes sense. Oh, right? it does actually make sense. But yeah. still, you're welcome. But still, but yeah, that was a great episode. The Ghostbusters cartoon terrified me as a kid. It was just this like basically typical scenario: a kid in bed at night. Turn the lights off, maybe hearing a sound. His parents have gone to sleep, and there's just a little light coming from the closet, and then the door starts to slowly creak open. 
and then this massive headed creature with this gigantic nose and just grimacing smile came out. Yeah, it's hard to explain it if you didn't see it when you were eight years old or whatever. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes. It's still freaky. Yeah, it's a, the Ghostbusters cartoon. But one of the other reasons I want to do this episode is because lately, and I, might, I don't know if I mentioned this on a previous episode, but lately in my room, weird things have been happening. Like when our friend Pat was staying here, I was just telling him, oh, just so you know, and he's he's a non-believer. You know, he doesn't believe in anything woo-woo, anything paranormal. At least he says... He's um, a logic professor. He's not allowed to believe. But he kind of believes more when people tell him their own individual accounts. But anyway, I was telling him, just so you know, like, I've been having some weird stuff going on up there. And this is that room where I had my out about experience years ago. This is the room where I had that cup flown at me when I was a preteen. But lately, I've been up there and I was sitting in this blue kind of rocking chair. I was just watching something, end of the night, and I just feel it move up slowly just for like a moment and then go back. I've never felt this before. And I was like, that was weird. And then... Like you were levitating out of the chair? No, no. Like it was being rocked forward. Oh, so a little boogeyman pushing your chair behind Yeah, and then, so then like a moment later, lift up again. It was really bizarre, but I... I was, it didn't freak out or anything. I was like, that's strange. And then since that night, weird things have been happening. Like you remember the other night where that the fan changed the speed uh-huh. and then the lamp fell off the table. Yeah, it was scary. Yeah. I mean, it was like 20 minutes apart, in, but in the dark, you know. Yeah. And then the lifting of the blanket that Jeremy talked about on the Skinwalkers episode. I had that same sort of sensation of mm-hmm. all like in the same night. I mean, who knows? Uh, but I did start to think it was kind of creepy because when that chair was lifting, I was like, why would this be happening all of a sudden? And then I remembered... I do have a Ouija board that was given to us by our friend Nick. And I forgot that when I moved into this room, I put it under the couch that was sitting within fingertip length of the chair I was sitting in. I mean, probably not. So nothing. the Ouija board reached out <laughs> and pushed your chair. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird stuff in that room. Anyways, but it just got me thinking about, you know, what is it about closets? What is it about? Because I was sitting right in front of the closet. These dark spaces. Yeah, what is it about, you know, so getting into the research, there's some really interesting stuff about cultures around the world and how they build their environment to keep these things at bay. Yeah, there's some interesting anecdotes too from just places we've picked up on ideas about where these things might be around us, why they aren't wandering around. And I mean, you see ghosts everywhere. Well, I don't, but I mean, people see them <laughs> everywhere. But there is something to be said for the dark corners, the recesses of the rooms. And there's American folklore going back and folklore all around the world talking about that, these dark places. So we'll, we'll touch on that. But also, in this episode, it's going to be kind of fun. We have, uh, we may pepper in uh, some lizard people or maybe just one story. There's a classic story that we're going to play later from uh, Jordan Maxwell. It's from an actual eyewitness encounter. He's a researcher, story collector, yeah, and right? It, it is more like a reptilian, alien, but it comes from the closet. Story, but it comes out of the closet. So I had to include it because I've been wanting to play a story forever. And maybe we'll do a reptilian episode at some point. We probably will. Uh, but I just really wanted to do it. So, and it's it is one of the creepier coming out of the closet stories. Uh, and every time you say that, it sounds hard, like something else. Too. Right. Yeah. But just try googling monsters in the closet for research, and it's yeah. going to be tricky because you've got you know you get a lot of yeah. It's definitely there's a lot of. Uh, it's not, a loaded uh, phrase. Yeah, it's a loaded phrase. Yeah, I was looking at um because we're, we're going to get into like our architecture and the importance of closets and some druidic practices and the idea of conjuring spirits and how these closets might have been places or just basically small dark areas that you know modern times would be closets. Right. But when I Jeremy's like, going to read a spell. I'm not going to read a spell. No. <laughs> but uh, I was looking at witchcraft and you know uh, altars in the closet for practices. Right. And you, but anytime you Google like witchcraft closet, it's all about how you have to keep your Wiccan practices hidden and you know what you keep in the closet. It's, uh, yeah, it's all the metaphor. So it's hard to really do research specifically on closet closets, yeah. entities, or closets. Which is uh, why we expanded the concept into just spirit architecture in general. Right. How to defer spirits from your premises. So that and stories. It's going to be a good episode. Some scary stories. It's always good. It's true. It's always a good episode. And stick around also for, if we get to it, if we have time, into some uh, creepy, weird bird encounters. We've talked about that previously, but we've had more reports of experiences. And so we may... Coming into the hole. We may get into that. We've got a great speak pipe that we might get to. Yeah, there seems to be a pattern brewing. A birdly pattern. We have two patron stingers today, too. Brandon and Rachel. Awesome. Brandon and Rachel. Yeah, stick around for those guys. Cool. All right. Do we want to get into the heart of the darkness, Jeremy, and get into the closet? Let's move the hangers aside. Let's turn off the light. I feel like we should take a break first. And let's take a break. Okay. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, listeners. You guys ready to get into the boogeyman? I am. Let's get into the closet and see if he's ready for us. Let's start off by taking a trip. <laughs> Let's take a trip around the world. Where? Where should we go? Well, there's multiple places we can check out on the uh, boogeyman destination map. And the reason is because this phenomena, for those of you who haven't looked into it or aren't too familiar with the subject, takes place or has occurred in virtually every country in the world. And has been going on for hundreds of years. Hundreds of hundreds thousands. And hundreds. Probably since the dawn of man. Since closets were invented. Since, since caves existed. <laughs> That's true. Since uh, Paleolithic man roamed mm-hmm. the uh, wastelands of ancient earth. Before caveman had the courage to reach inside the cave and begin making his home. It's a fear of the dark. Yeah, fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. And that'll be, of course, you know, the obvious thought on anyone has like a kernel of skepticism in their mind, which most people do. They're going to think, you know... It's an easy scapegoat, man. Dark places, dark places the imagination can roam are, are biologically built to be afraid of the dark because it's dangerous. Because, you know, in prehistoric times, yada, yada, you get that whole spiel, you know, we protected ourselves by by being afraid of these places. And right. So there's a natural inclination, and this is just a, a hangover. Yeah, I feel like that's one of two arguments that people make against the idea of sort of a global boogeyman phenomenon. That's not an actual entity or spirit or variations of an entity or spirit that actually exists, but it, it's either that or it's people who are trying to keep their kids from getting into dangerous situations. Those are the two kind of skeptical... Yeah, but neither of those explain phenomena, though. Exactly. And they also don't explain the common threads of some of the folklore, especially you start to get into the realm of shadow people and the hat man, things like this, where why do you have these certain archetypes? They're things that have not been told to kids when you're growing up. Like when you were growing up, you never said the shadow person in the closet is going to paralyze you. He's going to be wearing a fedora and he's going to have red eyes and he's going to give you the most terrifying experience. You don't hear (laughs) that. (laughs) Yeah, that's not usually... a nice preparation, though. Right, yeah, nice definitely. And even if, like, that's the other thing, too, is it's like that's the argument for cultures throughout time. It's obviously not something we do today. It's definitely not encouraged to teach your kids about the demon that lives in your closet to keep them safe. So right. why does it continue? And would it just be like you're genetically coded because of so many stories over the centuries? I propose that it's potentially a real entity that exists throughout all of human society and has since the dawn of man. There's a potential reality with nodes of truth. You're going to say that again? All through it. That's good. Yeah, it's going to be one of our taglines. Nodes of truth. <laughs> but John, I liked, how you, I liked how you put it because you're right. It doesn't explain the phenomenon. It explains a potential uh, cultural belief right? They can grow through stories and tradition. And that could have been spawned from this evolutionary, instinctive, protective mechanism to be afraid of the dark. And then the belief spawning out of that. But it doesn't explain the phenomenon. You can be skeptical and you can be logically minded, which everyone should be going into any of these topics. But if you're alone in your room at the middle of the night and the closet door starts to creak open, or you hear something brushing against the coat hangers and they dangle and jingle, and you think to yourself, okay, it's it's air, there's nothing in the closet. It's This is my evolutionary mind that's grown to adopt these beliefs and fears. And as you're looking through the closet, a hand reaches out. Something starts to come through. At what point are you going to say, okay, this isn't an evolutionarily inspired hallucination. Right. This is something that I'm now I'm now seeing. I'm not just afraid. I don't just have a belief. Now I'm witnessing it. And that's what you're talking about, John. That doesn't explain that phenomenon. Mm-hmm. It can only go so far as explaining our our cultural belief. Right. And it's maybe some like you know hallucinatory experiences. There's a lot of similarities too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's get into that. Let's go across the world. Let's take a trip. Let's go. Pull that barge horn, John. Wow. Oh, that was my plane. What is that? <laughs> That's a plane. It's really it expecting doing? you to just put something in and post. <laughs> Instead, I got your beautiful... I'll, I'll blare it with okay. the real plane sound. <laughs> It'll be great. Okay, so let's begin. Where are we starting? Well, like I said, it's everywhere. Um, you got Croatia, Bulgaria, Brazil, Portugal, Bahamas, Spain, Norway. The list goes on. Literally, literally limitless countries and innumerable because there are infinite countries in the world. Right, and we will have... No, a... they're not. <laughs> I know. It's, it goes on forever. Ever. Just a funny way to say that. We will have a link in our show notes to a, a really expansive list if you guys want to dig deeper in this topic. But for now, we're going to cover just a few countries with interesting similarities. Croatia. We begin in Croatia. John Q. Croatian folklore music. <laughs> I didn't send you that. <laughs> you can find it later. Okay. Chris, why don't you read our boogeyman from Croatia? Croatia. The Croatian boogeyman or bogeyman is called Babaroga. Baba, meaning old lady, and ragovi, meaning horns, literally meaning old lady with horns. The differences vary from one household to another. In one household, Babaroga takes children, puts them in a sack, and then, when it comes to its cave, eats them. In another household, it takes children and pulls them up through tiny holes in the ceiling. 
She looks kind of nice, though. She does. This is a good illustration. And we'll put the, we'll put the artist's <laughs> I name I can't in imagine there. her doing any of those awful things. <laughs> she looks like she's tucking the well, child it's in. A, it's a, a wonderful artist illustration by this guy. I should have had his name in here, but we'll have him in the show notes. Obviously, it's a sort of a fun... Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's probably not This real. isn't like someone's a first-hand account. <laughs> that, that wasn't a... <laughs> it wasn't an eyewitness account. Okay, yeah. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. What were you going to okay. say? Oh, that's the creepy because you hear the the sack, right? And this is a this is a thing that you'll will hear all throughout these stories across cultures is this taking children in the sack, right? Either to take them away to be eaten or to be chopped up or you know used in some other kind of creepy ritualistic result. But um, the creepy one in this is the uh, she pulls them up through tiny holes in the ceiling. That's weird, yeah, because there is like a phobia that a lot of people I've I've worked with people who have a phobia of small holes. It's they interesting. Push, they pull them through the whole tiny holes? That's what it says. Does it miniaturize them? That's or? what I'm wondering. Or does it just pulse with such force Making that spaghetti. it smashes the child? As uh, By the way, we should say... Really uh, awful. Really disturbing. I just keep thinking of my friends now that Without have children. They listen to our show and they're like, I can't listen to some of your episodes because the kids stuff. Oh, yeah. So just so Wouldn't you know... Wouldn't recommend that. Any of, any of you guys out there who have kids, you're very sensitive to the idea of kids. It's and very w- unlikely that this will happen to your child. Right. Especially very the tiny unlikely. Right. <laughs> I had an ex-girlfriend who called her grandma Baba. It gives it now a darker connotation. Well, it reminds me of ba- the Babadook, which isn't that what it was called? The ba- ba- Babadook. Babadook. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's apparently a real thing. Yeah. Well, Baba means grandma. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't a monster. She's kind of stern, but all right. Uh, what your ex girlfriend's grandma? Mm-hmm. She was. She wasn't a monster. She was pretty stern. She was stern she though. Was no monster. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. The next one comes from uh, Catalonia. Um, now, this particular version of the boogeyman, uh, children were told that the Hombre del Saco, or Man of the Sack, was a man that took away the children in his sack, obviously. Also that he used the fat of the children he killed to grease the rails of the Barcelona railways. Mm-hmm. That's why you want to read it. Oh, because he wanted to do the, the list? Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> I like saying it. It's very sexy. That's how you pronounce it in, uh, I think, in Spain, Catalonia? I would imagine that's how you pronounce it from the place you came from, otherwise... But like Mexican-American, South American, Spanish, it would be Barcelona. Right. Come with me to Barcelona. Barcelona. <laughs> uh, great place. like to go. But again, it's this idea of, I mean, Krampus anybody? It just reminds me of that. Exactly. Like, have you been misbehaving? So really, Krampus is just a, a seasonal boogeyman, right? It's the Scandinavian sack man with horns who takes kids when they misbehave, but it just happens to be on the holiday. But it's the same concept. Well, exactly. And either these things were real or people in the old world love putting kids in sacks because it right. seems to be some... It was a global phenomenon. Right. Sacking children. All right, John, bring us into Germany. Okay, Germany. Germany, here we go. Germany. <laughs> in Germany, the boogeyman is known as der Schwarze Mann, the black man, the boo man, or the Bootsemann. Schwartz does not refer to the color of skin, but his preference for hiding in dark places, like the closet, under the bed of children, or in forests at night. So that's interesting. The same kind of idea of... Der Schwartzmann. Yeah, the dark figure, right? It's because of the darkness of those places. And it, again, it's the closet and under the bed, which, of course, we have those. And that's probably the most yeah. common places in a room, especially a child's we room. We had a Der Schwartzman in our hometown who terrified children on the streets at night. What? Remember? Officer Schwartz? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow, Chris. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. He might be listening. I hope so. Good dude. All right. He's uh, probably a big fan <laughs> when he's not pulling kids over and stealing yeah. their pot. Oh, wow. <laughs> Getting in there. Yeah, Schwartz, you bring it. <laughs> that was so long ago. Just kidding. That's when Pot was He bad. has a twin, you know. I know. I saw him in Akron. I was very confused. All right. So the next one, <clears throat> I like this one. I actually, when we were first talking about doing a related show on, on these topics that was more cut and dry, I always want to look into the boogeyman, and this one was particularly creepy. It's uh, It comes from uh, England, I believe. There's an English boogeyman known as Black Annis. Now, this goes to, of course, boogeyman can also be boogie woman, if you will. But in the English boogeyman, Black Annis, she wore skins of children <laughs> whom she had presumably... <laughs> not dark. ...who she had presumably eaten around her waist. And there's a really great image from DeviantArt from Jay Farron. We'll link in the show That's, notes. Yeah, pretty cool. It's really great and terrifying. I don't know how you draw stuff like this. Like, we think, where did this come from in my heart, <laughs> in my mind? But it's really creepy. It's this... It's just- so terrifying. Yeah, this creepy image of this old woman with this, you know, robe on and a belt Human of... Human skin. Yeah, a belt of child head, skins of child's heads. Okay, this is getting really yeah. dark. Hey, Let's move along. Isn't there Hansel and Gretel coming out soon? A new one? 
I saw a preview movie? for that, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's pretty, it like dark? pretty creepy, yeah. Yeah, it's super dark. Has it got The Rock in it? <laughs> it's got The Rock. <laughs> and uh, He plays the witch. Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon plays <laughs> one of the kids. <laughs> He's like, whoa, guys, what am I doing here? But it looks pretty creepy, I'll have though. to check it out. Yeah, it definitely, definitely, you know, it's things are yeah. compared to how things it's gotten real intense yeah movies well and then those very I mean, dark it's taking it back to the roots you know right like the but that's a pretty stories. just the idea of it is pretty scary oh yeah dark dark stuff Stay we, out actually, of we talked about in the previous episode and the idea of the, like, the breadcrumbs like today we use you know internet browsers have uh, the breadcrumbs on a website to go oh, right, back where it came from, from. yeah that, you know, every time you have breadcrumbs. That's reference. for bread. Oh, really? That's mm-hmm. where it came from. Wasn't that four one one episode? Not the best. Not the best thing to use though, because it can be eaten by yeah, exactly. Like, it will be animals. Eaten. Yeah, but I guess that's probably the only thing they had for like. You can, use, what like, rocks? Rocks yeah. are plentiful and they don't cost anything. Is that they the also rock don't I, get eaten by things. Right. Chickens though digestion. First of all, you got to carry a sack of <laughs> rocks, which are how heavy for a child. You're, and then you're gonna be like, wait, was that the rock I put down, or is that just a rock in the that's woods? That's a good point. Yeah, so yeah, sure still out. paint the rocks or something. Well, then you got that takes time. If you're leaving in a hurry to go see the witch, you're not gonna take time to get out it your just paintbrush. Makes no sense. Almost as if it's a story. <laughs> it's right. I never thought about it. it's an edible trail you put yeah. behind you in the forest full of hungry animals. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, not real smart. Come on, Hansel. Get it together. All right. So now this is this is an interesting point. This kind of goes into an idea of what might have been a, a possible explanation for this cross cultural reference. Yeah, etymologists have been trying to discern the origin of these stories. Of the word boogeyman. Right. Like where does it, where did this start and how long ago? And it's still being debated. They still are not sure. And there's still a, a hot a hot debate. Such a hot debate. Such a so hot. Um, <laughs> about about today. this. Like where where did it start? What is the derivation and what time period? So at one point, they thought they had an answer to this question. In Southeast Asia, the term is commonly accepted to refer to Bugis or Buganese pirates, ruthless seafarers of southern Sulawesi, Indonesia's third largest island. These pirates often plagued early English or Dutch trading ships, namely those of the British East India Company or Dutch East India Company. It is popularly believed that this resulted in the European sailors bringing their fear of the, quote, boogie or bougie men back to their home countries. However, etymologists disagree with this because words relating to boogeyman were in common use centuries before European colonization of Southeast Asia, and it is therefore unlikely that bougis would have been commonly known to Westerners during that time. And th- this is still accepted in a lot of places online. You find this this explanation. Oh, it's because of these pirates, and then they'd they'd get sacked by these pirates on the open seas. They'd come back, tell stories of these people, these boogeymen, and then, right? And then so it, it kind of developed in this culture that these men that come out of the shadows and steal things from you or hurt you or whatever, pull your children through tiny holes. Right. In the and then they're like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense because look at this culture. This term has been in their lexicon for you know centuries before this. Right. So keep looking. Debunked. Debunked. Debunked, you debunkers. Anyways. Yeah, interesting. I mean, again, it's one of those things where the the common threads make it fascinating. Is it just culturally fascinating, the the sharing of ideas and somehow the spreading of these ideas? You know, we, we don't know because we can't find the origin, you right. know. Or is it, which is fun to consider, a real, well, I mean, maybe some of the skin taking <laughs> entities aren't fun to consider, but the idea <laughs> that there is a, that there is some sort of supernatural element to this common entity. Right. Is there some reality of the phenomenon besides... Uh, yeah, passed down stories of pirates and other scapegoats. Maybe this explains the ridiculous high number of disappearing children every year. I feel like it every episode, every episode was like, this might explain the missing four and one phenomenon. <laughs> Sky this jellies. This explains everything. This <laughs> explains everything. <laughs> we can explain everything and at the same time prove nothing. Yes. Right. That would be a good tagline. It's, it's probably a combination of everything we've talked about. Yeah. Well, everything is connected and everything's so synchronistically intertwined, it seems like, when you look into the stuff. It's just the deeper you go, the more connections you yeah, find. I just think that's more of just internet search results. No, no, no. Point. I just mean in general, like any kind of the paranormal phenomena or even conspiracies tend to lead back towards occultism, which leads back to the supernatural, which right. leads back to paranormal. And the deeper you go, you find older and older connections that actually have roots in, in traditional ideas and reality and, and practices that were going on and are going on now potentially. And it's just like physics, right? right. I was talking to a friend about this recently. When you look into the quantum idea and the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, in this case in quantum theory, the more you realize things are intertwined and connected on the very basic subatomic level. So why doesn't it make sense that the more you look at stuff like this, the more you find things are... I mean, I guess this is kind of... Right. I know what you're saying. Yeah. straws, but... Um, no, I mean, I think really it does... It, you get down to that level, it can explain a lot of this phenomenon. So that's a whole series of episodes, right. I feel like, to get into that stuff. So yeah, interesting commonalities between these 
cultures and their idea of the boogeyman or the dark man. And it's, you know, it's the idea of child theft. It's also the idea of some cultures, it's a physical being. In some cultures, it attacks you and intimidates you in, in waking reality. And in other cultures, the common thread is in your sleep, right. this thing. But then in, in these cultures where this thing comes at you in your sleep, it has real world consequences, which sounds like, you know, Freddy Krueger, right? Right. And what if they meet a monster in their dreams? Then what? They turn their back on it, take away its energy, and it disappears. What happens if they don't do that? Well, then I guess those people don't wake up to tell what happens. And we've covered this before, but I thought it was interesting just to bring up again in light of this episode where Wes Craven got his initial idea for Freddy Krueger. Oh, yeah. It was that strange period of time in the 80s when you had those strange deaths from Asian men uh, that were immigrating to the United States and that you had this... What was uh, it? It was strange deaths from... Do you remember here? Remember this, John? Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll read you a little bit here. This is from, and I'm pretty sure this is the same article I read in that episode. This is from uh, History, written by Thad Morgan. Like Freddy Krueger's targets in A Nightmare on Elm Street, many of the afflicted were teenagers and young men. Headlines such as Night Deaths of Asian Men Unexplained ran in the LA Times throughout the late 1970s and early 1980s. Investigators could find no medical explanation for the deaths, but many community members attributed the deaths to chemical nerve agents that refugee soldiers of the Vietnam War would have been exposed to. That theory was not supported by doctors, however. So it was, it was uh, basically a series of sad, tragic, unfortunate deaths, but there were deaths where people were saying, uh, well, like the one, the story that Wes Craven had read was about this kid who kept telling his parents he was seeing this figure in his sleep and he'd be screaming, and I didn't want to go back to bed. Eventually, like, they make him go back to bed after I don't know how many weeks this went on, and then he's screaming in his sleep, dies, doesn't wake up. He was talking about this man, and uh, it's just interesting. Yeah. You know, it, it's scary. You know, granted, there could be medical explanations for this, but again, it's that common hallucination. And what does it sound like today? We talked about this probably on our Shadow People episode. That's probably when we talked about it. But the the hat, the man in the hat. Oh, right. Freddy Krueger had the hat. Right. The fedora. And not just yeah. any hat, you know. Yeah, that is not weird. Not a baseball cap. Yeah, not, a, not an Abraham Lincoln top, top hat. hat. Yeah. Although there was a top hat, man. That's a different thing. But uh, interesting. I just thought it was an interesting point to bring up that, you know, there are accounts of, of people actually tragically dying in their sleep due to what they claim to be real spiritual entities. Yeah. Scary. That's very scary. Dream catchers, man. Get some dream catchers. Yeah, there's a great image of uh, from the 1920s we'll have in the show notes showing the historical boogeyman in, I don't know if this is American or where this came from. It looks almost like it might be Spain or something. But uh, it shows an early depiction of the sleep paralysis phenomenon with the hat man. And this is from the 1920s. Where's the hat? Uh, yeah, I don't see the hat. That guy's got a little... He's got a giant head. Got a, well, he's got... It's a tiny little the, yarmulke. The guy on the right's got a little nodule on his head. I guess that <laughs> could be some that could racism, be like a, yeah, racism there. That is a creepy image, though. And it shows that this phenomenon's been going on for a while. And so the question remains, why? Right? Why? And we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but why closets? Why dark, shadowy places? Right. And I kind of like this. This is an anecdote I came across. On Reddit, there's a... Um, like a subreddit? Yeah, there's a subreddit that goes into the idea of these of closet identities, entities in the closet or these dark places, and why are they so frequently occurring in these... Like thresholds and thresholds, doorways. doorways. Yeah, specifically dark, small places in houses. And if there's any, like, linkage, you know, just like what we were exploring. Linkage. Yeah. Linkage. Stone. Back to Encino, man. I'm a unique weasel, David. I'm just underrated because I live here in Encino. <laughs> Probably sure. All ties around. But yeah, so this was a little anecdote I just grabbed because I thought what this guy had stated was kind of interesting, and it goes into what we've been talking about. American folklore told that spirits tended to hang in the dimly lit upper corners of a room, away from where people moved around. I would assume that modern closet structures were less common in early times. Also, my grandmother, a nurse, told me dying patients often conversed with entities in the upper corners of the room. That reminds me of The Conjuring. Yeah. Or no, uh, Insidious. Yeah. Right? Um, if you consider the places we think of spirits being, closets, basements, attics, etc., perhaps these are the dimly lit or dark areas of our homes which aren't foreign to human presence, but which aren't commonly trafficked through. In other words, it's not like a trunk or a kitchen cabinet where a person wouldn't be, but if a being wanted to avoid living people and light, these places would feel safe. So, like, the idea that, like, maybe spirits also enjoy their privacy or you know maybe why we see a lot of these things coming out at nighttime when everyone's asleep or the bewitching hour you know 3 a.m 2 a.m at at night uh it's when everyone's asleep it's when it's dark and that's when you hear the footsteps you know maybe it is like they just want to go out and stretch their legs and they can't do that during the day (laughs) because you're gonna walk right through them you know yeah i mean it's kind of a, a silly idea but at the same time like there could be some like you were saying earlier other laws 
that govern the the spiritual realm. Right. Where, you know, there could be this like uh, crossover where our spaces collide and maybe that's not where we hang out. We don't hang out in the closets. We don't hang out in the basement of the attic. So they hang out there. You know, we've talked about the having to be invited before in different relationships with different episodes, different um, entities. The idea of the invitation, it could relate back to that, these thresholds. Like the shadow person I experienced I had, which was terrifying, that took place in a doorway. And so many of those experiences take place in a doorway, the corner of the room. Right. You know, could it be this idea of the invitation? Maybe there's only so much allowance they're given to enter someone's space. Right. And if there's a doorway there, you know, and we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff more later on, we get into the spiritual architecture stuff, but it's a, it's an interesting idea. It does seem like there is some sort of physical laws that govern the spirit realm, although they might be different from our laws. Right. Just interesting. Yeah. And uh, another thing I wanted to bring up was the idea of like, this is kind of an interesting idea, but what if these things are remnants? What if they are left over from times when it was more prevalent to have practices of conjuring, right? The idea of conjuring a spirit or a demon, demonic force to grant you wishes or, you know, to give you certain powers. I came across this other interesting anecdote that says, During ancient times, such as the Old Testament, closets were originally used for housing altars for families who worshipped pagan deities. Some places still do. Maybe the dark things those people were praying to are still around and use the same method to enter our world and make people's lives a living nightmare. Now, that's just an anecdote from right. Reddit, but it got my mind thinking, because I'd actually was considering that idea before, is the idea of like, because they're feeding on our fear, right? The adrenochrome, the adrenaline, but it's it's feeding on it's that fear. It's an old fear. idea, yeah. They're feeding on the, the screams and the, you know, ba- all the way back to the, the worship of Baal or Baal, you know, the god of child sacrifice, you know. And then there's that famous, the arch of ball and stuff. And that's like a threshold in a doorway. I mean, there's all kinds of directions you can go with that. But um, specifically the idea of these entities being conjured, especially if they're conjured in these kinds of dark, private places. And maybe they were conjured. I'm not saying like someone, you know, ancient times conjured something in your closet. But the idea right. that they were brought to this plane through a conjuring. And now maybe they're left here and they're wandering and they're they're still seeking they're that stuck. same fuel. Yeah. Yeah. And they're it stuck It reminds here. me of the, the Loch Ness, Alistair Crowley episode we did where he left the door open because he couldn't finish that ceremony. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea when he had that ceremony that he got from the Grimoire, the uh, Book of Abermelon, about how to conjure the guardian angel, basically, how to control the demon, nine demons Force of the darkness. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the idea of that was all these things happened at Loch Ness after he left there because he didn't end the ceremony. Oh, yeah, he didn't close the door. He got interrupted and couldn't finish the ceremony, which was like a terrible thing to do because then you leave these entities at their own devices and maybe some of these things are lingering gin, lingering things that have been conjured. Don't know how to get back home. Exactly. Right. They're stuck. Just, just lonely people. There are yeah. stories about did Aleister Crowley brick up some of the leftover spirits because after that we talked about Jimmy Page's friend, Malcolm Dent, yeah. who was staying there and didn't even know the history, really, of the place. And he wasn't someone who believed in the supernatural, but had these terrifying experiences where he would hear strange sounds in the hallway at night. He would go open the door, look around, listen, nothing, close the door, go back to bed. Strange bangings and footstep sounds until it all came to a head one night and there was that terrifying growling and the shaking of the door like it was going to come down. Again, like doorway, couldn't come through the door. Some demonic entity, all powerful, can make these horrifying sounds, obviously move things around, but he still can't come through the door. Right. So it's just another door thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, it reminded me of that. And it also reminds you that, was it Azalea Banks, the chicken closet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We covered that on on Instagram. What did she say? She was the one who was a... Bruja. Bruja, yeah. She she was a Bruja or Bruja. Uh, yeah, where she said that she'd been sacrificing chickens for the last three years. This was in 2016. Gross. She was showing off her uh, her chicken sacrifice closet or her closet of That's so gross, man. Dark witchcraft and uh, a video. And yeah, the Nasty. video. I mean, I have a link to it. We played it in that in one episode. Um, maybe we could drop a piece of it. But yeah, she's sandblasting or sanding down her closet that is so caked in chicken blood from the last three years of sacrifice. Got some. Three years worth of brujeria. Real witches do real things. And you look at her, like her Instagram, I actually just checked it out the other day when I was looking this up and uh, see what she's up to now with, you know, if there's anything dark and occulty. With the animal sacrifices? Yeah, I didn't find anything specific with that, but there's an image of her and it's just like we covered in the last Patreon episode, the the part one of the Illuminati. Illuminati card game. Illuminati card game with uh, Pink, where Pink is in that... The position, like that? Yeah, but she was at a, an award ceremony. An award ceremony and she's wearing that basically Freemasonic outfit in the position of an initiate. Right. Yeah, a Freemasonic initiate. One nipple out. One breast, one breast exposed. Uh, yeah, the one pant leg up, one checkerboard legged, and then a blindfold on. And then this picture of Azalea Banks from, I don't know, a couple weeks ago or something. She has 
an eye patch on instead of a blindfold, but it's covering again the one just eye. Just the one eye, yeah. And then she's got one breast exposed and, you know, one covered. And it's just, I mean, this was just an Instagram picture. Yeah. And then you look at her other Instagram posts and videos and she's wearing, you know, Illuminati eye. Uh, it's all very caked right. into It's this. just all a coincidence, though. You're right. She, I mean, she obviously still in that culture. She, yeah. And there is a dark path in that. You know, you can say it's trend and whatever. And we go into this in a lot of episodes, but there's obviously connections there if you want to go down that right. dark path. Anyways, her closet's gross. And her closet's gross and it's filled with... It's disturbing. Yeah. It's very I mean, disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, she got called out a lot for it, obviously, because you're what well, you're killing chickens to supposedly get ahead in the music industry. She, right. she came out later and said, like, oh, it was my dad who passed away. I'm, it's for him. I'm sacrificing oh, for him that? or something. That was like her... But no one really believed that. I don't that. think that's... Because you look at her personality. Well, she's, she had a witch... She called it her witch cave where she would go in and do, yeah. you know, dark magic stuff. And that was all for her dad, her poor yeah. dad. I don't know. I mean, you you watch her. Just, Maybe, I doubt it. You follow any of her communications, there's obviously a darkness and a drama and a anger. You know, it's not a bright spot <laughs> in the music industry. I don't know anything um, about her. So I don't know her personally. Say. I'm just saying her her image is not a bright spot. It's it's very darkly influenced, it seems. But um, sorry, Azalea, if you're listening, I know you're probably a huge fan. <laughs> right in, uh, correct us. <laughs> yeah, right in and correct us. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to mention, we talk about doorways. This is kind of an interesting anecdote. So in uh, memory from our family, because I was thinking about witchcraft and doorways, the conjuring of things and doors and spells. And uh, I don't know if you know this, John, but um, when mom and dad had their first apartment, I think it was it in Wadsworth. Was Wadsworth, yeah. Wadsworth. Uh, this little apartment when they first moved in, it was it kind of a creepy place? Not a nice landlord. That's oh, okay. Well, maybe the landlord was involved in this, but when they were there, they had a really unsettling. Oh, weird feeling. neighbors too. Very weird neighbors. Very weird neighbors. Mom would not go to the mailbox when the neighbors were home for some reason. I forget she was the that details. bothered by them. Yeah, but maybe they were connected in this maybe. for what this was. But they discovered above their door frame of their front door chicken bones mm. up there, and that's a common thing. I was reading online about revenge spells, hexes, voodoo, hoodoo, voodoo, santeria, that kind of stuff uh, to put the bones of animals on or near the property, especially over thresholds and doorways where you, you might cross right. the path. Uh, and that's when you would be hexed. Just so weird. Wadsworth, Ohio in the 1960s, there's someone was putting, you know, voodoo spells on. Well, the stuff is, it's <laughs> prevalent. Strange. It's, it is everywhere in a sense, like we don't hear about it all the time and everything, but it's disturbing when you go online. I was looking for the stuff and I came across, I just want to find references to it. And there are websites with a lot of members on forums and stuff where it's all about teaching you the dark arts of how to do revenge spell an anger spell and it talks about boiling up your rage as much as possible your anger in order to hex people oh, breaking down animal bones <laughs> and going into detail about how and i didn't <laughs> for a second i was like oh this will be interesting to read on the show and link and i was like i'm not gonna like it i'm not gonna read that on the yeah. show because it's just so like to have that out there you know like just basically and especially you, to use like rage as sort of the soup or the recipe that's the behind food of it. it yeah that's just opens up things in your own life too that's like the that thing. i'm sure you can't it's shake self-destruct. easily yes for sure self destruct well, it's funny too because I, I came across it might have been the same site recently and we were we were doing an episode but I, even like the ones that are you know that seem on the surface maybe not so harmful or not so dark spells like casting love spells and i was reading this guy's post about like how i'm trying to get my ex-girlfriend back what do you, what are your guys' suggestions about you know she doesn't believe in this stuff she's uh she's religious though i feel like that might be an extra barrier how do i really make the spell extra powerful so I can get her back. And I'm thinking like, first of all, who wants to be in a relationship where they have to cast magic on a person for them yeah. to love them back? Secondly, a desperate person. Secondly, like coming from like more of a libertarian minded thing, that's like the antithesis of the principle of being a human. It seems like taking someone else's freedom of choice to even love somebody to, yeah. for your own sad. benefit. Like how deluded are you that you're a good person? Well, it's very in that sad situation. too to think. It's like, very sad. Yeah. You would want that outcome from that kind of process right. instead of this person loving you genuinely. Maybe he's 12 years old. Cause I can see 12 year olds thinking that But yeah, the, on the reg. That's, that's even more of a benign spell versus the stuff I was finding on like learningwitchcraft.com, which had the spell of, you know, hex of hate. And right. Obviously that's and, way darker and way more evil. Yeah. So with this magic with the doorway and leaving things in your path and this idea of this threshold that has a certain energy to it, John, there's a bit there if you want to read it that has kind of an interesting perspective on that. In the older days, our ancestors believed spirits lingered in doorways and windowsills. Just as a door or window protects the household inhabitants from the physical world outside, they also protect us from harmful spirits. Spirits were thought to be attracted to the living, be it their loved ones or enemies, and were thought to try to enter the home but sometimes get stuck on the threshold for one reason or another. This is why it's said to be bad luck to step on a threshold, to always step over it. It is possible to step through a door into the world of spirits, just as we step through a door into a building or to the outside world. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting thought. Like, uh, 
I'd never heard that superstition. You must step over the doorstep to a threshold instead of stepping on it because that might transition you into the world of spirits. It goes back to the oh, idea, weird, yeah. like you said, the idea of the vampire and stuff where there is this stop gap or this this blockage, this barricade where they need to be invited in. There's this energetic permission that has to be given in order for someone to cross that threshold from the other mm-hmm. side. Just kind of an interesting thought. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, on that note, let's take a quick break, guys, before we get into some interesting actual stories and encounters of these phenomena, strange things in the closet. We'll be right back. Thanks for, Welcome. thanks for coming back. Yeah. Are your guys at home or your closets closed? Because I'm sitting next to one right now that has been staring me in the eye this entire episode. Why is it open? It's just creaked. It's that perfect closet creature creak where it's just like a jar, just enough for me to see that it's dark in there. That's a great sounding closet door, too. Yeah, let me go ahead and do this for you guys so you hear how creepy this door is. You got to touch it. John's, old, John, John's old farmhouse. Oh, that's so oh, perfect. hello, monster. Oh, come on in. <laughs> come hello, on nightmare. in, monster. We're doing a podcast about you. <laughs> you got anything to say? I'm, I'm just a person like you. Is he Elvis? I've been in this sauna for so long. <laughs> the sauna. <laughs> this hot box closet. Well, let's get into some stories. Let's get spooked with some stories, guys. Let's get spooky. This first story comes from the great website of Encounters. If you guys just ever have an afternoon to yourselves and you're twiddling your thumbs, eating some Doritos, and you're like, what do I do with my time right now? Turn off the TMZ and go on over to Fams and Monsters and look at Lon Strickland's accounts that he's collected from people over the years. Really interesting read. And we get some of our stories from there. And today, uh, our first story comes from this website, Phantoms and Monsters. So is this a true story? Because these are all yeah, these are all accounts that people send in. It's not a creepypasta site. It's people, they either call Lon on the phone. And this one, I'm pretty sure, was a phone interview that he did. Um, and then people can submit stories too. Uh, if you guys have any stories out there, by the way, please submit them to beliefful.com. We'd love to hear your stories and we'd love to collect those and continue our resource of banked stories. But also feel free to send them to Lon Strickland's site. Uh, he's got a whole archive there. He doesn't need any more. Give them to us. <laughs> We're giving to us. <laughs> but yeah, so this is the first story. This is an interesting account. And we picked this one obviously today because it relates to the creatures in the closet phenomenon. So creatures in the closet. Creatures and dun, 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 dun. sorry, that's kind of a fun festive feel to <laughs> festive the... turn on the phenomenon. <laughs> Creatures in the closet. That's a song. Yeah. Sure has. Is that like Jamaican weddings like or something? Like mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no, that's like not a it. South American ditty, right? Dun, 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 really relevant. Dun, dun, really relevant, guys. Okay. I haven't heard that since school. Creatures in the closet. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to flesh that John out. John hasn't drank anything either. I we'll haven't. Flesh out in Patreon. I have. You don't have that. Sound to you? I don't. Darn it. Put it in now. We'll drop it. In the late 1960s, a local named Reg was living on Black Marsh Road in Newfoundland when his family experienced dark and unsettling things. The following is his account. I grew up there with my three sisters, 
Sometimes, due to limited space, I slept on a sofa in the living room. In the living room was a small stove and coat closet. I remember the chimney ran next to the closet. I remember so vividly being woken up between 3 and 4 a.m. every morning to the sounds of a group of people conversing in the closet. To the best of my knowledge, there were six or seven people. I could not pick out what they were saying, though at a moment I could hear them very clearly. This went on until we moved. I told my mother about this at the time it was happening, but of course it was dismissed as a child's imagination until many years later. Long after Reg had grown up and moved out of the property, his grandparents had moved into the same apartment. He continues. While I was away working in Toronto, I was talking with my mom over the phone and we happened to start talking about the closet. She told me my grandmother was asleep one night when she too was roused from sleep by the sound of people talking in the living room. She went back to check it out and she heard many, many voices in the closet. Being the strong-willed person that she was, she said the Lord's Prayer aloud, Greg said. When she was finished, she said the voices stopped, never to be heard again. Okay, so... That no monster, just voices in the closet. Yeah. Oh, I think that's creepier. People talking in the closet. I, I guess that would be people really having creepier. conversations in the closet. Obviously, you go in the closet. No one's in the closet. Six or seven people, individuals conversing, no, whispering to no one radio, another. No radio, no vent pipe from a neighboring. What are they saying that you can't hear? Hmm. What's the secrets they're telling? Is it about taking your family's souls, turning them on one another? I probably like that dinner. It smells pretty good in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. God, <laughs> I wish we still had stomachs that were physical <laughs> to digest that food. Is that time? She's using time in that? <laughs> I wouldn't put time in That's a fish meal. It's a fish meal. <laughs> I wish I could taste wine again. Oh, oh to be dead. Yeah, that's got to suck, man, being stuck in that, like, limbo place, if that's what happens. Yeah, we hear all the time, you know, those scary paranormal shows where they're talking about witnessing these things just walking or looking sad or, or uh, disturbed or oh, yeah. upset or crying. Or Your children are crying. Like all these terrible stories that are, of course, scary to people, living people. But how sad for whatever that is. Mm -hmm. If there are just... Not being able to communicate. Right. And then you get those assholes coming in and going, Come at me, ghost! Bring it at me, ghost! <laughs> I heard you were... I heard you were scaring this little girl. <laughs> Come and scare me! Come and scare me, you termite! And of course, of course... <laughs> You know, there's like the whole like demonic dark forces, which are a whole other story. Right. But it is sad to think about the, yeah, just the. If it if is, the, if there are, if it is, or, or it could just be tricksters, or just like sort of that. Remember we talked about that magnetic tape oh, theory, where tape. things just play over and over again. Stone tape theory. Although it seems like some people like they do have this interaction with them, which would. Yeah, they're different types, you know. There's the kind where they do seem interactive. Either you get the, yeah, it's my grandma or something, but then you get the other ones where it's like more dark and demonic where that seems very, very uh, interactive in a negative way. Mm -hmm. But then, of yeah. course, they're the ones where like the spirit or whatever it is, this uh, visage of someone, this apparition doesn't seem to pay you any mind at all. And that that kind of leans more towards the stone tape phenomena where it is this the repeating residual Like a energy. playback machine. Exactly. Almost. Yeah. I think it's probably a combination of all those things. But the weirdest kind of thing is a giant lizard in your closet. And I think we should do that story Yes. Next. Okay, so as I said earlier in this episode, this next story uh, is not a boogeyman of... I mean, it is a boogeyman, to be sure, but not the kind that would you would consider like a spirit or an apparition. It's like a physical thing, right? Well, it definitely has some physical traits in the story, right. but the concept behind it is... It's a fairly in-depth concept, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, So It's a whole... Series of shows. Right, this could be... Yeah, we're definitely going to do a show on like David Icke's reptilians, lizard people, because that stuff is fascinating. We've been looking at that for years. Pretty scary pretty scary some of the stuff but the the story behind this encounter it's a woman named nancy and she when she was just a little girl her dad worked i believe it was with project blue book one of the early investigators he worked with the military and they lived out in uh the southwest the united states somewhere maybe new mexico I'm not exactly sure we'll have a the longer story in the show notes with more background but essentially this story breaks down where her parents would never leave her alone in their home at night or even during the day. They felt it was unsafe because of things her dad was working on. They had encounters where supposedly their car hit one of these creatures. So they were very aware of these entities out there that they believed were extraterrestrials or some entity that was working with the government or was being tracked by the government. And there was this interaction with the people that her dad worked for. It's interesting. A little, a little side turn in the episode, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. 
And like I said, it could be another episode, which we will do, but just want to give you a little background on that. Closets are the other common thread here. Yeah. Yeah. We obviously it's exciting because it's a closet story, but, right. but anyways, her dad worked for the government in this capacity or the military, and they were very wary of these entities in the area and the potential repercussions of what her dad was doing with the military and the government. So this story was brought to light by Jordan Maxwell, who's a phenomenal researcher. He's been around Love that guy. for a long, long time. Him and David Icke had a conversation about this story, but this is the actual account from Nancy. So that kind of sets up the scene. But yeah, let's roll tape on this, John. My dad and my mom decided they, they would leave me alone for the first time in my life. Just for a little while, half hour to an hour, they were going to run over to my aunt's house and then come right back. Well, I, I assured them I'd be fine, and they left. And um, I went back into my room and after having locked the front door and everything. I turned off the light in the bedroom. I wasn't afraid of the dark. I enjoyed the dark. And I had a little window behind my bed that had some moonlight shining in. So it wasn't totally dark in there anyway. I was just listening to Claire de Lune on the record player. I think I was probably in there about five minutes or so before I was aware that there was this noise in my bedroom. And it was kind of a staticky electricity kind of a noise, but it grew in intensity. And as it became louder, I became more focused on where it was coming from. It was coming from my closet. It was a relatively good sized closet and the door was open. And I just kind of sat up in my bed and I reached over and I turned my record player off because I wanted to make sure it wasn't static off of my record player. Sure enough, the sound was coming from the closet. And as I watched the closet and the open space that was there, the noise just got louder and louder and louder. And then all of a sudden, the noise stopped, and there was just a clicking sound. But it was, it was not rhythmic. It was kind of arrhythmic, a couple of clicks, then one, and, and so on. And then there was a shape that just appeared. Just a shape appeared in my closet. And I really stood up and took notice that I didn't actually get out of bed, but, you know, I, I really came to attention. And I jumped up on my bed with my knees under me and my feet against the wall and my back against the wall and my hands against the wall. And I was just totally pressed back there in a, in a state of tension watching this wide-eyed as this dark shadow appeared in my closet. And to my shock and utter surprise, it bent down and moved out and stood straight up and it was taller than my closet. I would estimate the, the ceiling in that place was seven, seven and a half feet tall. And this entity, this dark form, was almost as tall as the ceiling was. And as I watched it, it hunkered down a bit and spread its arms out to both sides. And it was getting closer and it looked like it was trying to catch me at that point. And that freaked me out. And all of a sudden, part of it came into the, the shadow of the light that was coming through that window. And what I saw, I wasn't prepared to see because this thing was reptilian. I got a very brief glimpse of the side of the face, including one of the eyes and the hand. It had claws and Right at that instant, I thought I was lunch, and I just wanted to get out of the room, and I pushed with all of my might against the wall with my feet and my hands, and I bounded off the bed and just scraped by its claws on its left hand and threw open the door, whipped around the corner, got into the bathroom and locked it. Scared to death that this thing was going to get me before I could get away. As soon as I'd locked the door, I hunkered down between the wall and the toilet and just hyperventilated my little life away until I heard kind of a jiggle on the door. And yet it wasn't this creature, whatever it was, was not trying to get into the door. It started making these scratching noises on the outside of the door, just going right from the very top of the door frame all the way down very slowly 
to the bottom of the door. I did it three or four times. And then I heard the key in the front door and my mother and my father's voice. And they came in and the scratching stopped and I heard my dad call my name and my mother call my name. I just was so petrified. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. Where are you? And I was worried at that point that my mom and my dad were in danger, but there was nothing I could do. And then Nancy. as my mother and my father, I could hear them walking down the hall Nancy. calling me, and I wasn't answering, so they became more frantic. And they started screaming Nancy. at that point, and then my father goes, oh. oh, my God, at the top of his lungs. Oh and, and when I opened the door, I saw these deep grooves that had been just carved into the door by by this hand with claws and it, it had just made curls down to the bottom of the door frame and it was it was a very 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 scary and freaky situation made even more intense by my father's reaction to it because he said, that's it we're getting out of here we're moving right now we're leaving and right now. we did Time to go. we moved immediately after that get your stuff and my dad didn't Back have now. any more yeah. investigation calls it's like everything stopped. Time to go. If that thing had really wanted me, it could have had me at any time. There would have been no problem. What we ended up theorizing was that it was trying to scare my father away from something that he was working on, and that was the way they came up with doing it. Well, that makes sense to me, that it was merely trying to frighten him away. Right. Yeah, creepy story. Huh? Yeah. So it goes on. I mean, you can look further into that story. We'll have links in the show notes. And uh, her father, who worked for um, Project Blue Book, I believe, did she give her name, like her last name? Nancy? In the I'm not sure. I, I don't know if she, her last name was kept anonymous, but um, she's done several interviews, but she's not making any money from this kind of stuff. But uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be hard to look up and see who involved with Project Blue Book had a daughter named Nancy. Do you not believe her, Chris? No, I'm just Are saying. Are you doubting her story? She sounds genuine. I'm just saying. Don't doubt the fact. It's, it's another way to corroborate her account. Either way, it's definitely a freaky story. Yeah. Jordan Maxwell has talked in interviews about this or in conversations. And one of the interesting things he said was that that struck me, of course, was this thing was so tall that it had to bend down to get it out of the closet. Bend down to get <laughs> out of so the scary. closet frame. Yeah. How massive this thing, how no, terrifying thanks. would that be? And then also another thing, a phrase that he used that was interesting was, or she told him that uh, she got the impression that it was like this thing was coming up on a fly, like just hunting and just had complete control. Right. You know, but the story. Flies are hard to catch though. Yeah, they are. They, they can <laughs> okay. squirm away pretty Not quick. for frogs and reptiles. <laughs> so, That's oh, true. Good point. But the story going on, her dad says after that, like he decides to leave and stop working with the program and get out of wherever they were in the Southwest and leave the military or at least, you know, working with those people because there were these threats. The idea was that they wanted to give the impression that, you know, you're sticking your nose in our business, in our reptilian affairs, per right. se. Uh, we can come and stick our noses wherever we want. We can come to your children when they're so alone. So it came out of the closet. Yeah. So what did it, like, teleport there? Into the closet. Well, yeah. that's the thing about these closet stories. So many of them are, I mean, it sounds, you know, the boogeyman, we're covering that, obviously, but so many of the accounts of extraterrestrials, grays, things coming out of the closet, that's a huge thing. It's a good way, it's a good place to enter a home, really, because you can <laughs> transport anywhere. You don't want to just do it right in front of Plus, them. It's, it's you want to get your barriers, see where more they spooky. are in the room. Yeah, it's definitely more spooky. Yeah. Hey, little girl, little long little gray fingers coming out there. But uh, anyways, the story does go on to where the dad says, like, if anything happens to me, if I disappear or whatever... I've either been killed or I've been pulled back into the project somehow and to never leave him alone. And uh, when he got sick, he got really sick later, he told his wife to never leave him alone and eventually he died. And well, he's afraid to be left alone? Like left alone in a hospital bed because it's so easy, you know, they could either off you oh, or right, they right. could, you know, to hide the secrets or they could pull you back into the program for whatever reason, uh, basically disappear you. Yeah. But I heard a little bit later of that interview, which we'll link in the show notes, where she says, it sounded like someone who had been involved with the burial came up to her and her mom and said that there was no body. And then the guy like ran away after saying, I don't really? know if he ran away, but you know, he was like, he just needed to tell them and then he left. There's no body. <laughs> <laughs> just runs away. <laughs> so her mom still believed and she, I guess maybe did too, that, th that he was pulled back into the program. At least they believe that oh, for a while. Oh, that's interesting. He didn't die. But, uh, but yeah, that's an interesting story to follow. So God, how would you ever go back to sleep after something like that? For yeah, real. Never. You would never feel safe again. Yeah. But people who have like a person break into their homes, right. you know, they can never sleep. And imagine being eight foot tall lizard. Yeah. That scratches on your door. And it's there for you. Yeah. It's specifically there. to. Oh, and walls are not a problem for it. If it's no, real. It's a wall. I'll if just... it happened, you know. Yeah. But I, oh, it did. I want to believe. 
it's a very compelling story, and we should definitely do an episode on the reptilian agenda. I remember when I first started getting into that stuff. I lived in Texas at the time, out in hill country. Oh, yeah, spooky place. And, uh, yeah, and it was, you know, not remote, but there's parts of it that were very underdeveloped. And oh, it was yeah. hill country, so it was like these rolling hills with nothing out there. And low vegetation. It was just like I was convinced that these things were real. Listening to Ike and yeah, you know, all this stuff with new information and just like how they could just, you know, manifest and they were just these, just horrifying creatures yeah. that were part of our planet. That, you know, well, there was a feeling out there too. I remember walking with you down in. Well, they're they are in the Southwest too. Exactly. That's like where oh, yeah, a for lot sure. of them are underground. One of these these areas that seem to have some sort of like a. Uh, uh, special energetic energy <laughs> you know, traction. When we were walking in Barton Springs in Austin and we walked down away from the city, the creek bed was dry and there were these boulders and it just, out there it felt like there was a lot of nothing, but at the same time it felt like there could be anything. Unlike other places that I've been where it just had a special enchanted feeling, like enchanted rock out there. Mm -hmm. That is a strange feeling place. Yeah. Definitely pretty spooky. It's all real. Uh, I was going to say that or just her line of saying, I knew that if this thing wanted me, it could have mm -hmm. gotten me. It's just, it's so, it's such a pervasive, pervasive, rampant theme in these sorts of entities, like whether it's lizard people or dogmen, these otherworldly visitors where it's always that like, they could take me, but they didn't. Yeah, there's a certain power, restrained like, power. Yeah, I wonder if too, if it does have to do with like free will, like on mm -hmm. some level, like you can't inter interfere too much with the life of yeah. someone. You're allowed to you scare them. It's like a haunted house. Them. It's a haunted house. You can't touch them. Well, there's, yeah. there's rules them. to that. I was, I was researching something recently, but it was that idea where like when it comes to humans, there is a there is a sort of galactic or dimensional rule where you can intimidate as much as you want, but you can't physically harm in most cases. Unless what, they cross some, unless, unless the they humans cross some, do something they, some to opening, they invite it in, invite it in, right. or they do some ritual or something. But where was I? Was something I don't know if it was related to the show, but it was within this week that I was looking at something where they were discussing that exact thing. You know, like there are potentially these guidelines. You know that they have to follow uh, in relation to humans. Like a handbook for the dead. It's interesting. Yeah. Beetlejuice? <laughs> yeah. Beetle guys. Well, I read through that handbook for the recently deceased. It says, live people ignore the strange and unusual. Is there another story you have, right? Chris? Yeah, there's another story that I'd like to cover. Some of you might have heard this story before. It's kind of a classic one, but it, it is, it's such a strange case that I think it's good to cover. And it connects to some stuff we've talked about recently and people that have written into us, like Shannon gave us a good well, story. Well, let's tell the story first. Yeah, let's tell the story and then we okay. can. So this next story, uh, this is another one that's documented on... Uh, Big Bird? Mm-hmm. Do I get to read it? Yeah, it's for you, Johnny. Oh, good. This is another John case. Big Bird. Hold on, can I tell the story real quick? The Big Bird story <laughs> oh with <my> John? Gosh, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the story, John? Forgot about this. When John was just a wee babe, and he was just a little kid. He loved Sesame Street, just like we all did, right? And uh, mom had hired, or, or mom, who was it that was in the Big Bird suit? Do you remember? I think it was mom. Was it mom in the Big <laughs> Bird suit? Or, or Uncle John or somebody to come to his birthday party? It was your birthday party. party, yeah. They dressed up as Big Bird. <laughs> there was like this big plan. Mom was so excited. And uh, John, Big Bird comes, and mom's like, John, who, who is that out the window? John, come look. And you looked and you're like, what did you, do you remember what she said? You're just like, oh, okay. You're like, uh, oh, it's Big Bird. Big Bird. They like went on to play with your toys and like the whole thing was just like, womp womp. Oh, I thought I was like terrified of it. <laughs> you just like didn't care. I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's Big Bird. That's a big dumb bird. Can I get back to my... Uh, you're like he's on the TV right now. Dominoes. I don't need him in the room with yeah. me. I need my He-Man. I was much, I liked He-Man much more. Yeah, if you if He-Man would have showed up, I'd have been like... <laughs> Man. Da, 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 da. Is that he missed them, son? Yeah. What did you sing the other day on an episode? Oh, yeah. The power. No, you said. Thundercats? And then we said something, and then and then you said. Ba, ba, and we he all laughed. Man. It wasn't He Man, though. You were you, you put something in oh, the. Oh, I made like another. It was so funny. And I, now I know that it was just He Man's theme song. Not nearly as <laughs> creatively funny. Those are the only songs I remember. <laughs> all time. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, this is an this is an interesting account, and it's interesting because it is so bizarre, and we, we'll talk about the ramifications of it after John gives us the story. Here we go. This is uh, from Lon Strickland's site, Phantoms and Monsters. <clears throat> Big Bird. I was born in 1976 in Dayton, Ohio, and shared a room with my brother for several years. My brother had one side of the room, I had the other. We had a very large walk-in closet, and the door to it was at the foot of my bed. One night, as I was trying to get to sleep, my brother was already asleep, the door opened, and I know this sounds crazy, 
but out came Big Bird. <laughs> I remember Hi. being frightened at first, but others came out too. And they were very friendly and led me into the closet with them. That's not scary at all, <laughs> right? All I remember at this point is that Big Bird gave me a flavored chapstick. What? Most likely to ease my fear because I love chapstick. Okay, I'm scared. <laughs> and they brought me back to my bed. I went to sleep very happy over the whole experience and was not afraid anymore. What happened in the closet? I put the chapstick under my pillow after taking a tiny nibble, leaving my teeth marks just to see if it was still there in the morning. The next morning I checked and lo and behold the chapstick was there, just like I remembered. And at that moment I knew for a fact it was not a dream. If it were not for that chapstick, the experience probably would have not stayed with me all these years. I tried to tell my brother, but he laughed, as anyone would. It sounds totally crazy. Isn't that so strange? Oh, it's so... Oh, oh. It's, it's, it's horrifying weird because it's so innocent sounding. I know. To and their no, eyes. The weirdest thing is nothing happened in there as far yeah. as... But yeah, what did? As oh, far something as happened in there. Oh, it's so... It's, it, it runs along the lines of like the demonic thing where it's like they just... There's no reason for yeah. it. It's just like wacky. You know what I envision? Just to traumatize and... Oh. I envision Big Bird in there playing with the kid, giving him the chapstick and stuff. And then behind him are these tubes running from his adrenal chrome <laughs> sack. And the other Muppets are just like feeding off of it and he doesn't know. Ooh. Oh, it's just a creepy, like, yeah, what was really? the purpose? Well, it's yeah, a twofold, what was the purpose? To me, it seems like a twofold, like one, screen memory, alien abduction. You hear this sort of thing all the time where there's a completely bizarre scenario that oh. gets kids or, or adults to wander off to do uh, something. It's almost sickening. Where it, yeah, they hide their, the actual reality into something that makes you feel comfortable and sedated. Oh, yeah, it's, it's the old don't go But it's the same with thing strangers, with fairy with stories. Candy. It's the same thing. So that could be a scenario. Another scenario is apparently, I haven't looked into this yet, but this is fascinating. The reason why I checked this out was because in the full account of this guy's story on Strickland's site, Phantoms and Monsters, he says... Um, you know, Lon, I, I've never told this story to anyone except for my brother because it sounds so crazy. But after reading the other accounts of evil Muppets on your website, I felt like I had to share my story. And I was like, what? Evil Muppet stories. So then I did some digging online and apparently that is a thing. There is a thing with people's accounts of experiencing evil Muppets what? in disguise. And which, which is funny because it reminds me of, we, we did black eyed kids. Yeah. We talked that kind about of story that we talked about coming out of the TV, that kind of thing. What was his name? The guy who started the whole black eyed kids thing, Brian, uh. Was it Weatherly? No. Brian, whatever. Is, is that a patron? Brian, <laughs> Brian something. But uh, he had like the first Black Eyed Kid story that set it on fire, that idea. Right. And, and he had another encounter when he was younger. About right. The Muppets on the TV. That's what it was. It, it came out. They they like, ah. Yeah. Maybe they didn't come out, but they were talking to him or something. But yeah, that, that is a thing. The whole. And so we'll, well I have really a link. scary. I'll have the link in the show notes to uh, more encounters with people experiencing evil Muppets, which is it's kind of a ridiculous, but also terrifying. That's yeah, really scary. Yeah. Because it is that kind of preying on children thing. Like yeah. The, the wolf in sheep's clothing idea. I mean, Muppets and that stuff, I feel like are just kind of creepy to begin with. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then when they're real. It's like a fake human on your hand. You move around and yeah. animate. I don't like it. <laughs> Nor do I, sir. Um, yeah, so, you know, initially we talked about, we were going to, we had a, a great speak pipe from Shannon, uh, and it, it's about a big bird. So we thought we'd, we would relay it in this episode, but I think we're going to save it for uh, an episode on strange giant birds. Yeah, there's been more and more lately, especially in our area, which is bizarre. Like, We've had a few people write in, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. we had a couple write-ins about it, and then the one write-in we had... Um, we played in a previous episode, she linked us to a Phantom's monster, monster story that was very similar. Hers took place in uh, Lebanon, and then she found another encounter in Lebanon of this big, black, gigantic bird on the side of the road. That was her family's experience. And then, yeah, the one yeah. we got from Shannon was another big bird that she came across. It in, terrified uh, her. In Ohio. In Ohio. These are all happening in Ohio, which Northfield is or something like that. Northfield, I think, near Cleveland. And so I started to look this up because I was thinking, okay, you hear about these Thunderbird accounts in Illinois, Mothman in Illinois, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where the Mothman encounters happened. That was on the border of Ohio. And there were a lot of uh, sightings that occurred actually in Ohio at the time. So I started to look at like... At the end of someone's account that they had put online, at the bottom they had talked about migration. So I was like, this would be interesting to see. So I started Googling the states in between to see if there was a pattern. And there is an interesting pattern occurring between Illinois and Ohio, all around the Great Lakes region, but going through Indiana and Michigan. So I thought, let's save this story for an episode where we really go in depth on this idea. Yeah, because her story... Uh, Shannon's, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a Thunderbird. It's, I've heard stories of these kind of like the Lebanon. No, it sounds like a, where a it's, bipedal, more like a Mothman type Like thing. a Mothman type thing where it's this all black creature with glowing eyes, or I don't know if Shannon's was glowing eyes, but 
this like just ominous large bird figure sta- standing still, yeah, but very tall and just. Are we going into this? No, I just mentioning that that that's probably what we're going to do in an upcoming episode. Maybe the yeah. next one. It seems different and unique from the Thunderbird. Well, and the pattern it's is a little creepier, right? And the pattern is interesting. These sightings that are occurring around the Great Lakes area and recently. One thing I did want to mention on that, we did have a uh, a message uh, from a listener, Tori, on Instagram, who actually commented that her grandma used to talk about an ostrich farm where he'd bring back giant eggs for all the grandkids. And she was saying this isn't necessarily a solution, but apparently there is an ostrich farm in a Sugar Creek, Ohio, oh, yeah. which is about 45 minutes. Well, from yeah, us. there's ostrich yeah. farms everywhere. Well, they're just rampant across well, no, the country. I think she, uh, she wrote it and said that because I think John said, are there even ostriches in Ohio? Right. So there's ostriches farms in Ohio, but you see an ostrich. It doesn't look like a typical flying bird. Yeah. It looks like a an ostrich. Right. These stories seem to be more like six foot tall actual birds with wings down to the ground. Yeah. And all black. Um, but yeah, we'll save that for an upcoming episode because it seems like there's a pattern growing and it seems like we're starting to follow these recent accounts coming in. It would make for a good individual episode. It absolutely will. And we will do that coming up. But right now, but right now we want to talk about where are we when did we take the last break. Are we do for another break yet? Before we go to break, we should do maybe a Patreon stinger. Who we got on the pipeline here? I'm gonna do Brandon. Oh, Brandon, yes. Thanks for your patronage. All right, Brandon, I made a song for you. Hope you like it. Here we go. For the love of belief, Brandon Watkins <laughs> gave his five dollars per month to get in the hole and his generous nature. <laughs> we don't take for granted. He's got a lot to offer And I know he likes soccer And graphic novels The wicked and the divine Cool And he's always on time And he never ever lies He's strong as lightning And he might be Pleiadian Brandon Watkins is a ten If you need a hero That's great. That's going to be in my head for a while. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon, yeah, so thanks, much. thanks, Brandon. I hope you like your patron. He sent in a great thing we're going to have to share in our show notes, but it's that, I sent you that, John, it's that oh, yeah, yeah. I saw it. image of, it's like tears of uh, different levels of like conspiracy theorists or like mm-hmm. woke There's person. a lot of stuff I've never heard in there. Yeah. There's a lot of great topics in this image that he sent in. So I'll we'll post that in the show notes and, and touch on that in a future episode. But for sure. For sure. Thank you, Brandon, for your patronage and your support. We really appreciate it. And all of you patrons out there, it really makes a difference to us and it can help us keep doing what we're doing and hopefully eventually be able to do this full time and put out more stuff for you guys. So if you're interested, go to beliefful.com. Click on the Patreon button, and uh, you can sign up for bonus episodes. Click on the uh, link for the the expansion tier, and you get an extra episode every time we release a regular episode on the main feed. So check that out, guys. For real. For sure. All right, let's take cool. a, a quickie. Yeah. Let's, take, let's, <laughs> let's not, have a quickie. Let's not do a quickie. When we get back, we're going to get into spirit architecture and some interesting concepts behind how cultures create their surroundings to ward off evil entities. And we'll teach you how to barricade yourself from the boogeyman. Get it. Stay tuned.
And we're back. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. Welcome back, guys. This is an exciting part of the show. Welcome back to the third and final installment of Belethal, episode four, season two. We're about to teach you how to spirit bind your malevolent entities with architecture and design, right, Chris? Better living through spirit binding? Spirit thwarting. Probably a better way to put it. Yes. Yeah. We're going to get into some interesting cultural creations regarding how to prevent spirits from entering your domicile or how to keep them distracted or confused. Um... Spirit architecture. You know, this made me think of, uh, remember the movie 13 Ghosts? Yeah. I really wanted to play the clip, but I know we're worried about stuff. So yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't play it, but there's a great scene with Matthew Lillard where he's talking about the spells on the, these glass walls that keep keep these ghosts at bay. Do you remember this movie, John? What was it? 13 Ghosts. Oh, yeah. It's a great movie. Great, great movie. Great 90s. But I was going to play that clip. It's so good. One of the best I think we ever. could. I think we could play it, actually, but uh, we'll, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll drop it in. Um but he's talking about spells warding off ghosts, and that's why these spells are scrawled all over these glass doors that this <gasps> maniacal villain has built to basically create a ceremony at the end that I capture could, these spirits for his own power purposes. Well, right? he's going to become the 13th ghost or something and have all this. It's like a Jafar situation, basically, for the dead. <laughs> right. um, but it seems so campy, the idea of, like, spells stopping ghosts. I've never heard that before, like the idea of casting a spell to hurt a ghost. You hear about spells right. on people. You don't really hear about, I cast spells to keep ghosts away or things like that. So I was like, just out of curiosity when we were doing this episode, is there any factual history to that idea? And I came across this really interesting article. Um, Jeremy, if you would, please read an excerpt from The Devils and Spirits of Babylonia. Ooh. And this this part is, uh, the, this first part comes from a Sumerian sorcerer. Oh, wow. We're going that deep? Mm-hmm. Back we're going deep. Cuneiform like days? The alliteration with that. that right? Sumerian sorcerer? Yeah. So just read the quote. Okay. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth or a phantom of night that hath no couch. Really? Is that? Mm-hmm. Oh. That's the translation. Like a place to sleep? I'm assuming. Okay. Or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a hag demon, or a ghoul, or a robber sprite, or a weeping woman that hath died with a babe at the breast, whatever thou be until thou art removed, until thou departest from the body of the man, thou shalt have no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand. Into the house enter thou not. Through the fence break thou not. Wow. There's a lot of thous in there. Yeah. So obviously that's like, that's like to bind spirits from entering a home. Is that right. what that is? To oh, wow. The, a barrier, which we're about to get into a lot of spirit barrier ideas. But this comes from... This is back from the Anunnaki days, right? Oh, yeah. This is uh, ancient Samaria? Yeah, BC, BC time period. <laughs> this is kind of a range there. Well, like 600 BC, we'll, we'll, we'll explain here in a second. So the article continues. So begins an incantation that started life on the lips of a Sumerian sorcerer six or seven millennia ago, before being penned into a clay tablet in the 7th century BC by the Assyrian scholar and then placed in the great library of his king, Ashurbanipal, at Nineveh. When the Babylonians sacked Nineveh in 612 BC, they consigned the library and its 30,000 tablets to the dust. So this is a translation of one of these tablets. In the 1840s, it was excavated and the tablet was taken to the British Museum where the scholar Reginald Campbell Thompson translated it. That's why you have some of those more old English sounding things like robber sprite. That's Mm. the translation from the Babylonian text. And 43 similar incantations into the first volume of the devils and evil spirits of Babylonia. Babylonian and Assyrian incantations against de- against the demons, ghouls, vampires, hobgoblins, ghosts, and kindred evil spirits which attack mankind, which was published in 1903. Huh. So it went from, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years ago, B.C., to discovery to eventually translated in 1903. Wow, can you imagine being that Sumerian sorcerer who, like, just came up with that? Like a millennia ago, and it's like someday this will be published in a in a British work in the 1900s. <laughs> right. So I just thought that was interesting because I I hadn't heard about spells being used to bind or can, I, mean, I guess it makes sense. It's all in the realm of the of the supernatural spiritual world. It's interesting because that connects to this completely off topic idea. But the I don't know if we we mentioned this in the CERN episode, and I don't know if you guys heard about this, but in CERN they had animal skins with uh, Arabic oh, right. and other ancient languages that had printed these 
I don't know if they were spells or what they were, and but they're and it sounds all conjecture. This sounds like a rumor, but there were skins with these ancient languages uh, printed on skins at CERN around the Collider or or in that area. That's I bizarre. mean, that goes back into the weirdness of CERN. We went into that episode in our CERN episode. That'd be something to look up. Yeah, but it does remind me of that. The, yeah, the Matthew Lillard scene where he's explaining these glass windows with these incantations scrawled and stuff. But these were skins, animal skins at CERN with carvings into. Yeah, I wonder what they said. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Um, um, did you want to say something? Oh no, I'm good. See, I, I just wanted to, ch- to look into that real quick because I'd, I've heard of or about to get into, which is the architecture stuff. So around the globe, there are cultures that throughout time have developed ways to. To pro- keep spirits out, right? To protect themselves from invading dark, malevolent entities and spirits. Or even just the spirits of the dead. Right, exactly. Um, so that's what we're about to get into. And uh, why don't we start with China? So in China, you've all seen the, the roofs in China, these beautiful curved roofs. The curved eaves on the end of the roofs, like right. in, on pagodas. Right. Yeah. So allegedly, and this is there, there's some contention around this idea... Well, we know that there's a belief in Buddhism that spirits can only walk in straight lines. Oh, that's interesting. If they're coming down from the sky, you have these sort of curved roofs. It would kind of throw them off, cast them off like rain. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Another example in China is spirit screens. Spirit screens are shadow walls. And this was used in traditional Chinese architecture. They were used to shield an entrance, uh, create a gate, and can be positioned either on the outside or the inside of the gate they are protecting. Oh, it looks like in Japanese traditional culture, uh, apparently the northeast part of a home is the kimon, or devil's gate. This is where the oni, a type of demon, passes through into your home. Right, and this, this is still a thing today. Like, they still build apartment buildings around this idea. They don't put bathrooms in the northeast corner. They don't put doors. They don't put anything to do with heat, with fire or water. Oh, yeah, it says there can never be a door in the kimon, and absolutely nothing can be built involving fire or water, like a stove, bath, or sink. Right. That's interesting. That reminds me of uh, the bedroom that you grew up in, John, mm-hmm. at our folks' house. Um, Chris had a sleep paralysis episode where you saw that thing standing in the doorway. Oh, right, right, in the threshold. In the threshold yeah. of the doorway. And John, you... It was north, but it wasn't northeast. Right. But John, you, in that same room, on the wall next to the bed, you said you saw faces at one point. You remember that? Uh, no. Really? Or did you just tell me that to scare me? I don't remember ever saying anything like that. You once told me that on the wall next to the bed... You woke up. Are you talking about it on Stonewood? No, this is at our. Oh, yeah, I do vaguely remember something like that. I thought I saw lights in the wall. Oh, maybe it was lights. I thought it was faces. Not faces. I remember, yeah, lights in the wall. That's weird. What were they doing? Like in the wall next to your bed? Yeah. That's weird. I don't remember specifically. I just remember that happening at one point. That was the one room in the house that made me feel weird when I would go in it for some reason. Yeah, it was a kind of weird room. And what's interesting is I don't get that feeling in the room anymore, but Chris brought up the idea that maybe that's because. Well, mom had that change of, she changed, changed the modern. architecture of the room. Yeah. She she closed the threshold where I saw the shadow person. Doors and she knocked over. down the wall where you saw those lights. Like she got rid of all the all the paranormal entrance thresholds. Like some part of mom's weird in-touch subconscious mind because she's always has these. I honestly still kind of like, I've slept in that room a couple of times. I've had like really weird dreams in there. Yeah. I don't know if it has anything to do with that, but it, it is still kind of have a weird vibe. And mom even had that. Fart ghost in there. The one. fart ghost. Fart ghost. I remember that. And she's had some kind of weird experiences in there. Yeah. But I, she hasn't had any super negative, except for that fart ghost thing. But I, I don't think any other... It's smelly. It's smelly, man. Didn't they just ask it to go away? Yeah. Dad's like, the power of Christ compels you. Fart, fart ghost. Fart ghost, <laughs> leave. They would just smell things. Smell like sulfur. And dad would be like, I didn't do it. And mom, cause mom would get mom would, David. What is th- why did you do that in the bed? And he'd be like, I didn't do it. And then she, maybe they were each denying it. Yeah. And but they, then they must have supplied it. By the rules of well, they <laughs> the rules of the trade. They were kept smelling this, and I think mom was like, "Well, or maybe dad was just like, well, he googled it, of course. Yeah, he googled it. Well, maybe there's a fart ghost. Yeah, and then apparently there is. Apparently that is a thing. Yeah, like the the random smelling of it's that sulfur smell. The sulfur, that's like yeah. a common thing. And that's yeah. connected to like demons because and, sulfur's in farts and in hell, apparently. Oh, yeah. Brimstone, sulfur, that kind of thing. The point of that conversation was it was just a joke kind of about, you because know, mom has all these experiences with family members that die after they die. She seems to know when someone's going to call, that kind of thing. A lot of people She's have that touched sort of, in that way. Yeah. So she wouldn't say I that, just thought, it, what an interesting idea if, like, you know, she closed off that threshold where I had the shadow person and she knocked down that wall where John saw the lights. But it is interesting that the structure of the room has changed since those experiences occurred and it was never an acknowledged reason for doing that. Maybe I think she just wanted a bigger room. That's probably <laughs> 
That's pretty much the only reason <laughs> why, she wasn't why like, she I close that door. The ghost. I think it's because she heard your guys' experiences and secretly, she didn't want to tell you, but she was like, she's part of I'm getting rid of these evil spirits in our she's home. Like, no. She's like a secret shaman. <laughs> she never told us. Does not sound like mom. No, it doesn't. The lady who, the most dangerous thing she did when she was younger was a Chinese fire drill. I know. Which is you stop at a stoplight light. and run around the car once and then get back in. Before yeah. it turns green. Very scary. Very edgy. Yeah. Our mother. Why was that called Chinese fire drill? That's a good question. Because it's red in the communists? I don't know. All right, John. Why don't you bring us into the American South? Yeah, this is one of my favorite ideas. Okay. <clears throat> Haint Blue is a collection of pale shades of blue-green that are traditionally used to paint porch ceilings in the southern United States. The word haint is an alternative spelling of haunt, Hmm. which was historically used in African-American vernacular to refer to a ghost or in the hoodoo belief, a witch-like creature seeking to chase victims to their death by exhaustion. Originally, haint blue was thought by the Gullah to ward haints or ghosts away from the home. The tactic was intended either to mimic the appearance of the sky, tricking the ghost into passing through, or to mimic the appearance of water, which ghosts traditionally could not cross. The gullah would paint not only the porch, but also doors, window frames, and shutters. Blue glass bottles were also hung in trees to trap the haints and boo hags. Ooh, boo hags. Is that interesting? Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because that idea of water not being able to cross water, the next thing I want to get into is all about the threshold of water and circles within the Native American community. It's interesting how it all ties together in different parts of the world. Yeah. So this idea of water being a barrier, that's the global phenomenon that transcends generations throughout time. And I came across a really fascinating work by Robert L. Hall, who was writing periodicals about this to try to change the concept in archaeological and anthropological circles. So in this section that's titled Ghosts, Water Barriers, Corn and Sacred Enclosures in the Eastern Woodlands, He discusses this idea, and you can find this in the American Antiquity, Volume 41, Number 3, published July 1976. And he starts by saying, Certain enigmatic prehistoric constructions in the United States were possibly designed partly as barriers to restrict the movement of spirits or to protect the enclosed area from unwanted supernatural influences. Ethnographic accounts indicate that in historic times, the belief was widely held in the United States that ghosts could not pass through water, and that the geometry of a circle was effective in countering magical or supernatural forces. Some implications for archaeology are explored ahead. This is an interesting idea. And he he goes on to talk about, basically, this is an article that he's written to try to explain, explain and counter some of the current understandings of what a lot of these mounds and ditches were built for, the earthworks, right? The earthworks of Native Americans in Ohio and other places, particularly the Northeast region of the United States and in our home state of Ohio, and how most scholars at the time were trying to explain these as drainage systems for floodplains and farming and things like that. And so he goes into this idea of, well, if you look at the oral accounts from these tribes, these circles were used to protect people from spirits. And he goes into it by describing the backgrounds of these different tribes. And that's what I want to do right now is talk about a few different tribes that are local to this region of the United States and discuss their ways of protecting themselves from spirits. Okay. So the idea was that these earthen or stone circles, maybe around burial tombs and things like this, these kinds of structures weren't for like agricultural purposes or for keeping water out. They were for ghost quarantine. Exactly. Essentially. Ghost quarantine. So like, I don't know, John, if you ever went to Columbus, there's a lot of uh, mounds down there from the mound builders, mm-hmm. the Hopewell Indians, uh, tribes like that. And the current thinking was basically these are ditches for drainage that are around these things. And this guy was arguing that it's a moat. This is a spiritual moat to keep the dead where the dead should be keep them away from the village. Right, which is interesting because it relates back to the idea of salt circles, you know, keeping a circle of some kind, usually water. What what do you get from ocean water? Salt, salt, circles of salt. This is how these things evolve, but this is an interesting idea. But yeah, so I wanted to talk about some of these tribes in our, in our neck of the woods and talk about how they blocked themselves from spiritual malevolence. Okay, yeah, so the Hopewell, that was Ohio, right? So the Hopewell, in Ohio, the Hopewell created a ceremonial construction including two mounds, an earthwork, and an artificial pond within which was built a platform for their dead 
with the remains of 300 individuals. The unique feature of the charnel platform over water recalls Aboriginal Indian practices and beliefs that water is a barrier for ghosts and supernatural beings. Hmm. And charnel means like basically a place where you put dead people, so a charnel platform. And the Omaha have a similar situation going on. John, do you want to read Omaha? The Omaha believed, for example, that ghosts would not cross a stream. So if a person was followed or chased by a ghost, he would make for a stream, wade it, or even jump across it. For no matter how small the stream, it made an impassable barrier between himself and his ghostly pursuer. This is apparently not a recent or introduced belief, as it is consistent with other Omaha practices. So at this point in the article, he's kind of connecting these dots like we do all the time with our episodes on how this is not a agricultural thing these, that these Native Americans are doing around the country and Northeast especially. This is a spiritual barrier. And he goes on to talk about the Iroquois. So in the Iroquois, uh, in describing the Iroquois concept of the soul, J.N.B. Hewitt comments in 1894, it is a common belief that these skeleton ghosts dare not wade through the cold water, preventing them from crossing in this manner fordable streams. This knowledge, it is claimed, often enabled persons to escape from these skeleton ghosts by seeking shelter on an island or on a rock surrounded by water. Ooh, skeleton ghosts. <laughs> skeleton ghosts, yeah. <laughs> I like that. But pretty scary if you saw them in the woods. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know if I would think, I guess I probably would naturally try to cross some sort of barrier like water or anything. I mean, whether it was a bear or a skeleton ghost, I'd probably do the same. Right. So in the Blackfoot, the concept of a water barrier is consistent. In one Blackfoot Indian account, graves were placed on the side of a river opposite the village in the belief that their ghosts would not cross the river to disturb the living. Among the Mi'kmaq of eastern Canada, the preferred graveyard was an uninhabited island not too near the shore. So again, it's these it's this constant theme of keep the spirits on the opposite side of a barrier of water. Yeah. Um, and the last one I wanted to touch on here was the Potawatomi. A circle of water or a water barrier may be believed effective in thwarting witches or other manifestations of the supernatural, but the very geometry of the circle or enclosure contributes to the magical effect, and ashes or other substances with special properties or associations may substitute for water. According to Allenson Skinner, the prairie Potawatomi sprinkled ashes all around both inside and outside, in order to scare the ghosts away from a house in which a death had occurred, and the Cherokee similarly scattered old ashes around the yard of the house of the deceased. This is comparable to the Iroquois rubbing ashes on a nursing baby's face when taken out at night so that the spirits will not trouble it. Interesting idea. Reminds me of Lent. Yeah, it does kind of. The cross instead of the or circle. Camp Luther ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> All Camp Luther. <laughs> Um, there's so much more fascinating uh, information in this periodical that I, I knew we wouldn't have time to get into, but it talks about the idea of like this, basically a barrier of a circle. And it doesn't have to be water as long as it acknowledges the concept of water. And when I read that, I was thinking, okay, a safety circle that acknowledges the concept of water, a circle of salt, ocean water is sea salt. So that oh. maybe that's where we get the idea. I'm sure there's other concepts behind that. But it, even if there's an, there's an origin about salt circles that don't relate to this, that even lends more to the idea that there is a reality behind this concept. If it's a global, uh, it, let's say the, the salt thing comes from a European tradition and the these water circles come from the Native American traditions. Um, Some connective knowledge. Right. There's something going on there that is a truth that exceeds the barrier of shared cultures coming together. Well, it's interesting because uh, I came across this anecdote when I was looking into the, the boogeyman stuff, uh, the idea of the closet, right? And um, the circle, because you hear about protective circles you draw in witchcraft and other practices, Wiccan, it's a protective place. But uh, there's this anecdote I found on Reddit, but it was interesting. He said, uh, I had to make a delivery to an old home and saw evidence of that American folklore. The home had its original foundation, which is very rare for a house of its age, since those original basements were prone to collapse. The entire basement was a big circle. Hmm. The owner explained that people believed negative spirits would gather in the corners. The whole house was built to avoid ghosts. I believe that entities need to use ambient energy to manifest. The kind of ambient energy that we may create ourselves tends to collect in corners of rooms, ends of hallways, and closets. That's interesting. Like, if you think of this energy as um, like a fluid, 
that it would uh, pool in corners. Oh, that's interesting. Right? And yeah. so the circle keeps that energy from being able to collect, and then that spirit or entity couldn't use that ambient or um, potential energy to collect itself into a more physical form that could then do damage or interact uh, in a physical manner with the living. That's interesting. That's an interesting idea. I mean, of course, you could always argue that, you know, there, with, without corners, you have no shadows. So maybe it's just sort of, it relates to eh. human psychology. No, nope. Ghosts. But it's ghosts. It's ghost it's energy ghosts. pools. Um, yeah, so definitely some interesting uh, parallels between, you know, not just the Native American tribes, but also cultures around the globe. And there's so much more you can get into with this idea of spirit architecture. We kind of just scratch the surface like we tend to do with most of our topics. Um, but this is, a, I, th I thought this was a good introduction on this idea. What an interesting idea that you can protect yourself from spirits by literally changing the physical nature of the environment around you, the feng shui. But let's take a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll wrap up with a little bit more of spirit architecture. So I'd briefly touch on the uh, Winchester Mystery House, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, and uh, just for a moment. Just for a moment. And then we, we're going to wrap this all up and take you guys home and kiss you goodnight. And tuck you in. And lock your closet for you. And lock your closet. All right, see you in a minute. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's episode of the Belief Hole Podcast. Just wanted to say thanks again for all the continued support for the show. If you could do one more thing for us, we need your help. We're on the verge of making Belief Hole an ever-expanding chasm of research, information, incredible stories, full of wonder. So if you have just 30 seconds, please go to beliefhole.com and fill out the super-duper short survey that will allow us to propel the hole into the future. Again, thank you for all of your support. We'll see you in the hole. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is the days. final installment of episode four, season two. Jeremy, take it away. I like that you're doing this like a... Uh some sort of like adventure story adventure book where it's like this is the final this is the final, the final segment final segment of the last show we will ever do oh, oh well, i feel like that gets said a lot knock on that wood i don't like that <clears throat> i never said that before remember that well it's neither here nor there neither mm -hmm. here nor there do you want this to be the last show chris <laughs> so you're starting starting some drama <laughs> So talking about spirit architecture and uh, confounding spirits through design brought me to the idea, of course, to the Winchester Mystery House, which right. a lot of people are familiar with the story. There's a mythology to the story, and uh, it is in contention for a couple of reasons. But here is the basic story of the Winchester Mystery House. So the Winchester Mystery House was a mansion essentially built by Sarah Winchester, who was the heir to the um, Winchester Rifle Fortune. Now, as the story goes... Overcome with grief in the wake of her husband's death from tuberculosis in 1881, folklore states that Sarah sought out a spiritualist who could commune with the dead. While she was presumably looking for solace or closure, she was instead given a chilling warning. Through the medium, William, her husband, told his widow that their tragedies were a result of the blood money the family had made off of Winchester rifles. He warned that vengeful ghosts would seek her out. In order to protect herself, William said that Sarah must quote, build a home for herself and for the spirits who have fallen from this terrible weapon. That sounds like an anti-gun <laughs> rights advocate. Well, it's funny because I always thought that it was... David uh, Hogg wrote this story. <laughs> at least the lore I thought was that it wasn't built for her and the spirits. It was built to keep her safe from spirits. Exactly. That's another, that's another story. Because of the confusing architecture. So Sarah was advised to leave her home in New Haven, Connecticut behind and move west where she was to build a grand home for the spirits. There was just one catch. Construction on the house could never stop. Quote, if you continue building, you will live, the medium warned Sarah. Stop, and you will die. Everybody dies. Some say the labyrinth layout was meant to confuse the ghosts, allowing Sarah some peace and a means to escape them. She supposedly slept in a different room every night. When movers were called in after her death, one lamented its labyrinthine design that includes many winding hallways. One mover told American Weekly the Winchester house was a place, quote, where downstairs leads neither to the cellar nor upstairs to the roof. The home boasts 950 doors, 10,000 windows, 40 stairways, 47 fireplaces, six kitchens, plus a trio of elevators. And I'm pretty sure there was only one working bathroom. What? No. Pretty sure. Really? Because a lot of this building was... The spirits don't poop. It should be a shirt. <laughs> spirits don't poop. 
but yeah, that was because that was the idea behind it, right? Was that you she just had to keep building. Now, this is the mythology. This is the story behind it. Um, skeptics have argued that uh, it was a trumped up for tourism. Right. There's actually one guy who I'm pretty sure he's a Freemason and he is deep into the lore of the Freemasonic connections with Sarah Winchester and believes that she believed that she was a reincarnation of uh, Sir Francis Bacon. And there's references to oh, that yeah. all throughout the house. And so according that, to him, it, like the, the medium thing was sort of trumped up, made up to get the estate to make money after her death. Right. But in reality, it was basically the strangeness about the... That it was supposed to be just basically a, a puzzle. Like she, yeah. she loved the idea of, of the puzzle in the labyrinth and it was about the purpose of design itself and the idea of structures going into the fourth dimension, you know, and all those connections. You can get deep into that. We're not going to do that now, but that's just one argument against it I wanted to, I wanted to mention. But that theory, the idea, the mythology and the mystery of that that she had built it for the spirits of those who'd fallen from the Winchester rifle or to confound them, to keep her safe from them. That idea, I think, had been there already, but the skeptic guy, the Freemason, said that he had spoke to people who had actually worked there, quote, in the old days, and he said that they were encouraged to exaggerate certain stories on the tours. But there's no real way to know what inspired the design, if there is some truth to that legend or not. It's really just neither here nor there, but I wanted to mention because it is probably the most popular and well-known American story uh, in relatively modern times of using architecture to confound spirits. And if you were going to do that, this would definitely be right. a place to do that. Although you would include more bathrooms since apparently they are afraid of water. Well, it's interesting. You would think like a place this big, like how many thousands of rooms, 10,000 windows, 40 stairways, uh, 950 doors. Like I get like she's into Francis Bacon. But that seems like a very eccentric way to spend your money to make your entire house a puzzle. Not only that, but to also never have a plan for the ending. That's why, to me, like the spiritualist aspect of like she's been basically been given orders to build this thing by the spirit realm because of, you know, people that have fallen by her, her husband's uh, legacy. Then it would make sense why she would if she was ordered to continue construction, you know, for forever and onward. Like that makes a little more sense to me than she was fascinated by Francis Bacon, so she devoted her entire fortune to building this mansion well, and yeah. it could never stop being built. But if she believed she was the reincarnation and she had a That's Francis true. Bacon and she had all this money and if she was a Freemason and carrying on this legacy, because apparently she was a Freemason. Right. And there were from women Freemason at the time, so yeah, it's possible that she was just very... But so what's, the, what's the purpose, though? I guess my point is like at I the mean, end of the day, if you're rescuing yourself from malevolent spirits, that makes sense to me. If the purpose is just to make a giant puzzle, rich people do weird things with their money. When you have so much money, and, and if you are like an obsessed person, mm -hmm. you could definitely do anything you wanted. And plus, it's, you know, I mean, it's an amazing place, looks awesome. Yeah. That'd be a fun, bleep whole trip. Yeah. We'll That'd have pictures cool. of this in our show notes, guys, of the uh, Winchester Mystery House. There is like a litany of, of ghost stories that about yeah. people that have worked there and have had experience of people dying and during the construction. Well, it is kind of intense to think about how many people have died because of that name, you know, right. yeah. because of the weapon itself. Like right. it, it does carry a lot of weight to it. It's not like they made plastic or something. Yeah, revolutionized warfare. And as I'm saying that, I realize that I don't really know that that's true, but it sounds like a good... Sounds like a good line. <laughs> what, the guns revolutionized warfare? Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. pretty sure there was a, a civil war, <laughs> well, right? Didn't, the sp Winchester specifically. Yeah, didn't they, they kind of began the, the production of, not semi-automatic, but like the ability to it was have a, more than one bull in the chamber, or something like that with the reload potential. I don't know. I, we are not gun experts, but the Winchester right. rifle was known as, quote, the gun that won the West. So that's, if you guys are curious about that, we'll have links to that in the show notes. Definitely is amazing to look at. You can take tours. It's in California. I don't know if it's San Diego or... Or who's a what's it where, but it's somewhere out there. But you guys should check it out. <laughs> San Diego sounds right. Yeah. And uh, let us know your thoughts on that. And that's pretty much what I had for the the last little tidbit of this spiritual architecture concept. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there are aspects of the show that we did today that could be a whole other episode. I feel like we do that a lot, where there's, you could break down the episode and we could, we, we could do a whole episode on Winchester and the and the history and the lore there. We could do a whole we episode from on. From the Boogeyman to David Ike's Reptilians to <laughs> right. Winchester. Yeah, there's a lot. I feel like oftentimes a belief whole episode could, we could break it down and parse it out into a season. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. It looks like an awesome house. I'd love to visit that place. Oh, it'd be incredible to visit. Let's do it. It almost looks like Disneyland or something. Yeah. Well, it's probably just as big. You just, it's not as functional. You can't get, really get <laughs> yeah, around true. in there. Yeah. So there's stair and one bathroom. Really? I'm still stuck in that. There's one bathroom in the whole place. There's staircases that lead Don't to. Don't take Jeremy's word on that. There's staircases that lead to nowhere. There's uh, I knew that. Yeah. There's um, doors that open to like a second story drop. Yeah, there is one particular door that opens that if you walked out, you would die because yeah. it goes nowhere. There's, you know, uh, doors that open to brick walls or whatever. But yeah, that's a interesting, definitely interesting concepts. Um, 
you know, we could have gotten into, I didn't look into dream catchers, things like that, but the, just the idea of spirit protection, I guess, is a whole other thing. Well, in the doorway, like the witch's knot was something you'd hang over your door for protection. And I right. mean, every single thing we touch on here goes leagues and leagues deep into different direction. And if you guys are interested in looking further into these subjects, go to bleefhole.com, check out the show notes for this episode. Yeah. And you can do your own deep dive and let us know what you think. All right, so we got another patron stinger coming up before we end tonight. And uh, if you guys sign up on Patreon, if you haven't signed up yet, we're going to start reading names to thank all you guys by name on the show um, in hopes that you will recognize how much we appreciate you guys. And everyone that's been there for all this time, we really appreciate you. Feel free to write in. And, and if uh, you've signed up before this list began and you're really irritated that we didn't mention your name and we've never reached out to you, I find it hard to believe, but if it's true, reach out to us and we'll read your name in the next we'll episode. We'll give you a special shout out for that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so this is for Rachel Wood. Um, she is studying to be a librarian right now. So That's cool. Books are cool. This is sort of a funny one. I tried to make it funny. <laughs> it's, good. it's always good to tell a joke. We'll be the judge of that. Set up the joke by saying you want it to be funny. I want it to be <laughs> funny. Uh, I don't know if I know. Do I have to laugh? I don't think it's funny. It's a scenario no. that may or may not have been recorded during an actual encounter. Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that whistle's creepy. Hi, can I help you with something? Oh, yes. Uh, hello, Rachel. That's a lovely name. Rachel, I have a little problem. It's actually a problem with, with sunlight. Turns out, if I let myself be exposed to it, for even a short time, it burns me. I mean, it really burns me. It's excruciating. I mean, I know I'm pale, but I just feel like I'm going to die when I'm in it, if you know what I'm saying. Would you happen to have any books on surviving sunlight methods of not burning to death? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. That sounds like something you need to see a doctor for. <laughs> yes. Hmm. <laughs> well, since I'm here anyways, I have another problem that you may be able to recommend a book for. You see, this one's even a bit stranger. I used to love looking at my beautiful face in the mirror. But for some very strange reason, I can no longer see my reflection. It's almost as if I don't even exist. Do you have any books about mirrors or why I may not be able to see myself? Yeah, that is really strange. I mean, that's just such an odd request. This is just a library. And although it is a wonderful library, I don't think you're gonna find any books anywhere with those kind of subjects. You know, I listened to this paranormal podcast called Belief Hole, and it's starting to sound to me like... like you're a vampire. You're really kind of creeping me out, and I, I think I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Oh! oh I'm, I'm so sorry, Rachel. You seem like such a very lovely young woman. The last thing I'd want to do is... The, the, the last thing I'd, I'd want to do is... The last thing I'd want to do is... I'd want to suck your blood! <laughs> <laughs> oh dear god. Oh jeez. This is very embarrassing. I mean, how could I not know this? <laughs> this would explain so much. It's all becoming so clear. Well, I, I can't help you, but, but maybe you could listen to the Belief Hole podcast and find some answers? Yes! <laughs> they are lucky to have such a smart listener as you. <laughs> yes, I think I will, Rachel. I will go find them right Thank now. You. Thank you again so much. Good luck being all right. All right, bleh. What? Good luck being a librarian, Rachel. I am off. That was weird. Oh, that's uh, great. I like that awkward part where he r just realizes he's a vampire. Right. Oh, this is embarrassing. I like the part where he's like, <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> I can just Hold on, did he have an accent? It's so like, short, too. Did he have an accent before he turned into a vampire? Because I yeah. feel like that'd be a good tell. He sounded also, like a vampire sounded, Bernie, Bernie Sanders vampire. That's what he sounded like. 
He had an accent the whole time, which was like obviously like. No, I mean like before he turned into one. I wonder, did he have one? Because if not, that'd be a good tell. Like all of a sudden you sound like oh, you're yeah, from Eastern sure, Europe. For sure, for sure, yeah. You're for Transylvanian sure. Southern. So I guess we have to do a vampire episode, right, John? I guess. Yeah. yeah. You never wanted to do one. We have a good friend who actually is deep in the lore of uh, the real Dracula who yeah. we're talking, talking to about potentially doing an episode. So maybe, maybe we'll get into that. Because like, there are real encounters with actual vampires. There are some. Sure. No, there are some pretty fascinating stories about this. Uh, yeah, no, I think that would actually be a fun episode. I mean, just, you know, it's so like cliche right but i'm well, sure there's a ton of like real encounters but when we started i remember one of our first episodes we talked about things that seemed like the most far out there thing that we you know out of all the paranormal conspiracy stuff like some of the things that seem so ridiculous like well, zombies obviously think will forever be ridiculous except for the what we talked about earlier oh shut it we're scientific vampires but scientific, scientific uh, vampires that sounds like a band name. I when it relates to scientific uh chemical you meant scientific zombies what did i say oh yes um but no, the uh, some of the things we mentioned were vampires. Very hard to believe. It's in, in our intro. Werewolves. But we're, we're, we're pretty much all deep believers in dogma. Well, I think about. vampires seem kind of like, I mean, maybe not, you know, the whole living forever thing. Turning but into like bats. People that do drink blood and stuff like well, that. Why not? I mean, you see that now with scientific research about using, using blood. Blood of the youth to right. modern Kate dude. Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale of, of Underworld fame. <laughs> of Underworld fame. <laughs> no, you're talking about um, Madame Bo not Madame Bovary. That's a terrible book about a bitch. It's Marie um, Baphomet. Not Baphomet. Uh, I know you're talking about Bathory. Bathory. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that would be you interesting. You killed a bunch of young girls to make herself, try to make herself a little, little longer bathing their blood. But I'm Ugh. talking about But is, we're using that technology now, right. which is interesting. Right. And that would be a good episode. We could tie it. Technology. <laughs> well, it's now genetic it's genetic research about the right. yeah that would be good to do. Um, and there there are some interesting accounts. There's one that I heard of that would be really good to dive into, where it was about a guy who was like kind of as a joke. He was a paranormal researcher, but he's like, I'm just going to do this to see, basically, to study the sociology of um, underground cultures in North America in the, the, like the 80s or the 90s. Yes, he's like he's like I'm going to do a call out on radio stations in urban areas and see if I can locate vampires. Just say like, are you a real vampire? Let's have a conversation. And he goes through a series of interviews and like, obviously interviews you, with a vampire, as you would expect, <laughs> uh, like 95% or more, maybe 99% were, you know, dumb. just dumb or like the guy he could tell he's putting them on. Uh, but there was one particular woman that blew his mind. Every conversation they had, she always seemed to have an answer for every question about the history of the area she was from, this and that. And uh, there's a book that he wrote on it. And that would be a good one to cover in it's a vampire really, episode. Can you imagine like starting to think, okay. You're this, like, okay. I mean, what do you do? Like, I mean, you're kind of putting your life in jeopardy, aren't you? It's just, right. just like, like Christian Slater did. Oh, right. The at the end of that movie, spoiler alert, but that's what happens. Well, his interview right? with the vampire was the name of the film. Yeah, he much, writes. not that much of a spoiler. He's doing the interview. <laughs> well, no, but at the, in, at the end of the interview, right? Isn't he like, well, you don't have to say what happens. Okay, well. Now you'll Everyone lives even, on forever. Christian Slater was. He's the guy who's interviewing. Well, then, okay. He's doing this and he's going, hey, Brad Pitt. I like your things. I honestly think watching that now would probably be more interesting than when it first came out. That's a great... I've seen it like three times. Well, with everything that we've looked into with the occult and... Yeah, I mean, there's more weight to it now where I just back then had no clue about anything. Yeah, let's stat. Well, let's let's, uh, read the patrons. Yeah, we want to give a special shout out to Tammy. Tammy, if you're listening out there, uh, Tammy Andrews, thank you so much for sending in your design. Very cool design. We'll utilize it in our Belief Home merch at some point here in the near future. And anybody out there who has an idea for a T-shirt or whatever, write in an idea or you can send in an illustration. We'll always take it under advisement um, and see if we dig the direction. But thank you, Tammy. This is actually really cool. We are going to use this on some sort of design. We're not sure exactly what yet. But, but it will pop up in our merch store at some point in the poster. future. Yeah, or a coaster. Or hey, a that rhymes. Coaster or poster. Yeah. Or a toaster oven. Sweet. That for, we yeah. Anyways, thank you, Tammy, for that submission that really appreciate you putting your creative effort into doing something for yeah, the show so it's awesome excited about that let's thank some of the past patrons give a shout out yeah we want to thank some of our patrons that have been around for a while here uh if we do miss your name and you want us to call you out let us know but we're, we're doing our best to kind of cover ground that yeah we haven't done this yet so we're catching up and going forward we'll be reading these off more regularly so if you guys Become a patron, you will get your name read on the show in probably not weird accents like we do with some of our stuff. Maybe you will. Maybe John can do his vampire accent for some of these. <laughs> oh, yes, Rachel. <laughs> what, uh, where, which month are we starting? July? July 7th. 
Oh, and let us know if you don't want us to use your last name. Otherwise, I mean, we're just going to assume if you sign up on Patreon with your full name, we're just going to use your full name because yeah. it's a little more personal. Unless you tell us not to. So Yeah, because unless your name is Zhang Zanafafafer, there's probably more than one of you out there. Special thanks to Marsha Montgomery, Zayden Starshadow, our longtime good friend. Yes. Louis Stark, Raina, Tyler Young. Excellent. Dana Luth. Archie Clayton. Yes. Gregory Kramer. Ben Saffel. Oh, yes. Jesse Salerno. Yes. Ben Cherry. Yes. Alejandra Limon. Yes. Jeremiah Ralphs. Also, special thanks to Anna. Yes. Cat with a C. Yes. Donna. Yeah. You say cat with a C. Because there's a cat with a K later. Yeah. Dummy. River McDonald. Yes. Taylor Berry. Excellent. Tara. Yes. Brianna Sally. Yes. Courtney Ortega. Yes. Zach. Yes. Taylor Abbott. Yes. If I pronounced that correctly. Lena Koryovate. Koryovate. If I pronounce that correctly. Yes. Uh, Matthew Musleave, good old friend. Excellent. Uh, Jacob Mena. Yes. Mark Vielhaber. Yes. Oh, good oh, old dude. Yes. Good old friend. Uh, good, old dude. good old dude. John Gonzalez. Yes. Alex Bartlett. Yes. Abby. Sheldon Ladowski. Excellent. Logan Satterfield. Yes. Natalie. Excellent. Curtis Gasser. Yes. Deanna Daniel. Yes. Of Zing Zing. Yeah. DJ Benson. What? 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 Hello. Hello. DJ. Yes. Carrie Oliver. Oh, yes. Kenneth Higgins. Hey, buddy. Jessica Vilhaber. Kyle. Yes. Mick Harrow. Excellent. Christy Pottier. Yes. NB. Yes. NB, if that's Nick Benson. Yes. Better be you, Nick Benson. I don't think it is. But if it's not NB, thank you anyway. Yeah, thank you. you. NB, we love you. Way to ruin it. <laughs> yeah, seriously, if it's not you. Carrie Oliver. Excellent. And then Nick. Sweet. Nick Lopez. Excellent. Awesome, yes. guys. Thank you guys so much. You guys keep us going guys for real. Freaking Awesome. Yes. Yeah, if you didn't hear your name, you'll hear it uh, eventually. Yeah, we're going to do January next next show. And yeah. If you didn't hear it and you were hurting your soul, just just message us on Patreon. Well, let us know. Yeah. We'll hook you up. We'll say hi. But thank all of you patrons so much for supporting us and, uh, and keeping us going here. And if you haven't signed up, sign up and get the extra content. It's yeah, you, so good. You really get double the whole if you sign up for page. Oh, speaking of which, our patron episode this week is going to be the conclusion of the Illuminati card game episode. Predictive programming. So um, get on there while the iron is hot. Look and forward the to that. Cheese is grilling. And we will be back at you in a couple weeks with our next episode. Absolutely. We will miss you and we'll be thinking of you. Each and every one of you. See you next time. On the Belief Home. Later. Bye. Clear. <laughs>